Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to well, welcome back to our workshop. Before we re resume our session, um, we would like to once again remind you to turn on all your videos during the during the modules, and also to change your names to your actual full name so that you can be recognizable by your name. So with that in mind, we will now resume the workshop. So please be noted that except the speaker, the microphone will be muted during the presentation. And also, uh, you will you can use the chat box to ask questions to the for, for the speakers. So, and as we did for the last modules, the moderator will select few of the questions and ask the questions. Um, ask few of, ask the selected few questions to the speakers. And please be noted that due to the time constraint, not all your questions may be answered. And now we will move on to our third module which is on sharing Korean experiences in forestry sector. So please welcome our honorable speaker, Professor Johan Son of Korea University. Professor Son, you have maximum of 30 minutes. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, uh, it is my great honor to speak today. Uh, my presentation title is Experiences of Korea on Forest Management from Tradition to Modern Practices. This is the brief contents of my talk. First, a uh, short background and second, uh, tradition on Korean forest uh, with uh, feng shui and historical governance of forest resources and community forestry, and then uh, reforestation program followed by impacts of reforestation program and finally conclusions. Okay, first background. I think uh, traditional knowledge is indigenous to humanity and acquired over a long period of human interaction with the environment. However, traditional knowledge systems have faded since the global modernization of human societies, but some recently rediscovered traditions have proven themselves to be key components of sustainable development. So South Korean traditions are closely related to forest and the rich experiences of implementing modern forestry system. Basically, uh, Eastern Asian countries have highly relied on rice production, as you understand, and proper management of water resources and nutrients was essential in the region. And then uh, we had a theory of divination based on topography. In other words, uh, villages and rice paddy have harmonized with the forest, field, garden streams, and other surroundings. As you see on the uh, uh, bottom right figure, all those landscapes are harmonized together. For example, if you have a forest at the backyard, uh, you have a field and garden near the uh, homes and villages, and in front of the villages, usually you have paddy fields. Therefore, water, nutrient, and other resources circulate through forest rice paddy and streams in the mountainous landscape and especially forests were important as source of water and nutrient for paddy field. And then I move to the second part, uh, tradition on Korean forest. Uh, as I briefly mentioned that uh, topography, uh, philosophy we call Feng Shui, uh, ancient Korean forestry was based on the concept of feng shui, which governed socioeconomic activities and landscape management. 
according to this idea, the optimal location for afforestation depended on the location of human settlements. In general, people afforested the bare entrance and backyard. So in ancient Korea, villagers created Maul Suk, which village forest based on the Feng Shui concept. The village forests were considered the religious and spiritual areas. Sometimes it included the shrines and local villagers utilized it for livelihood, such as dead organic matter, fodder, and timbers. Uh, this is the basic form of landscape managed with the uh, Feng Shui concept. Again, uh, you see uh, forest land in front of the residential area, also backyard of the uh, human settlements. Uh, village forest provided some fodders and uh, dead organic matter, even some timbers for the villagers. And let me briefly explain the historical uh, governance of forest resources in Korea. Our country has a long history of forestry and early record of planting have been found. For example, early 200s uh, record of pine tree planting were found and some other trees were recommended for planting in late 800s. Moreover, all the laws and policies included the concept of right tree on right side. The meaning of the concept is that tree species for planting should be selected after considering environmental condition of the target area. In Korea, all the laws forced to select the tree species depending on local environmental condition so based on long history and traditional knowledge, we identify the right uh, species on right environment, in other words, right site. This table, this table shows some records of forest governance by ancient Korean kingdoms. In uh, third century, uh, Pinus dense flora of forestation near the royal tombs and palaces uh, were happened. And in 18th century, other species, including Korean uh, Pinus coriensis, jugulans, and moros, were planted, something like that. And kingdoms protected Korean red pine forest strongly setting forbidden bidden forest, enforcing illegal logging, monitoring forest, and controlling pine caterpillars, and so on. Also, kingdoms promoted cooperation with the local villagers. In other words, uh, they encouraged to manage the local forest and also allow the villagers to collect the timber and fewers and also encourage the participation of local villager groups for forest management. Uh, this figure shows the uh, planting of Korean red pine uh, surrounding a royal tomb. Uh, at the background, you see the uh, Korean red pine forest surrounding the uh, royal tombs. And also uh, we well protected uh, Korean red pine, uh, such as more than 400 years of Korean red pine trees in some areas. And also I'd like to briefly mention the importance of community forestry. Communities near forest play a significant role in realizing sustainable forest management. Uh, as you understand, community forestry refers to processes and mechanisms that enable key direct stakeholders in forestry to be part of decision making in all aspects of forest management. 
forest community forestry regime encompasses participatory conservation, joint forest management, and private private ownership. We had a special uh, local forestry cooperative such as Songye, and this Songye is. Uh, a uh, uh, local forestry cooperative for laborers to collect the timber and fuels and also to prevent illegal monopolies and poaching through participatory activities. And uh, members of Songye frequently worked with the uh, government, in other words, all the ancient kingdoms. Songye set strict self-regulations to protect the local forest, including penalties and ways of forest management and utilization. And also Songye had a participatory petrol system of fires and pest for local Korean red pine forest. This figure summarized the duties and benefit of Songye local forestry cooperative. They had duties such as provide labors, fees, and also they did fire patrol and forest watching. Also, they get benefit, including timbers, fuels, compost, and they can put ancestral tomb in the forest nearby. And they had self-regulation, and sometimes they worked with the kingdoms for forest policy and they share the forest resources. So these are the duties and benefit of Songye. The key concept of Songye have been adapted in reforestation in recent years as a Salimge. Salimge is the, another name of local forestry cooperative in modern days. Salimge act as a self-governing mutual aid association promoting cooperation between local villagers and forest owners. Members participated in site preparation, plant, uh, tree planting, seed collection, nursery operation, forest management, and area patrols. Economic benefit and technical support were given to Salim Ge in reforestation programs. So, Participation of both the government and the local residents were conceptually similar to the traditional way of managing forests, such as local residents use of a village forest. This is very similar to the duties and benefit of uh, Songye in uh, all the days. A little bit modernized and more systematically uh, managed. Let me uh, introduce some uh, reforestation program in Korea. Despite the effort of ancient Korean kingdoms, forest in the Korean peninsula diminished because of poaching, private forest monopoly, and natural disaster. And subsequent to Japanese colonization and the Korean War during the 20th century also destroyed the nation's forest. The South Korean government launched a nationwide reforestation program since 1960s, which is still one of the most successful reforestation activities in the world. Success of this program was considered to be the result of diverse drivers, including the rapid growth of Korean economy, the strong leadership of the Korean government and the substitution of energy source, sources. And nonetheless, uh, several practice for this program originated from traditional ecological knowledge and practices inherited from ancient Korean societies. As uh, I briefly introduced participatory program was very successful during the reforestation program. Also, strong collaboration with the local forestry cooperative was a key driver for successful reforestation. 
The South Korean government encouraged public participation in reforestation, similar to historical forest governance during the Joseon dynasty, which is a kingdom. The South Korean government specially attempted to gather voluntary crews for reforestation activities to overcome labor shortages. These governmental efforts imposed the responsibilities for the reforestation activity on people across all social areas, including schools, institutions, militaries, and workplaces. These photos show the participatory reforestation activities during the reforestation program during 1960s and 70s. One notable strategy of the South Korean government was the establishment of Salim Ge, again, local forestry cooperative. This cooperative was responsible for reforestation, forest management and patrol, and forest resource harvesting. Members of Salim Ge secured food and other incentives while they obtaining technical support from the government if they attended to the reforestation activity. Salim Ge markedly contributed to the nation's reforestation program and was a core driver of public participation at the local level. Again, uh, tree selection, tree species selection was very important during the reforestation program. So the government specified the tree species for the reforestation program on the basis of the climatic zones and site classes of the target site. And site class indicate the potential level of productivity which was calculated using topography and soil properties. A site with low site class were revegetated using economically valuable species, whereas site with, I'm sorry, uh, fast growing species, whereas site with low or Productivity were restored using nitrogen fixing and stress tolerant species to first improve soil fertility. In other words, we planted economically valuable species on productive site. However, we also planted nitrogen fixing species and species to stress tolerant species to low productivity sites. This table shows the plantation species for the National Forest, forest, Reef, forest Restoration Program. On your left hand side, you see the site class from one through five. And depending on climatic zone, we recommended the specific species for the site class. So high site productivity site, more economically valuable species were recommended. And also we used the traditionally protect, pre, protected forest use for research. In other words, traditional ecological knowledge and practices indirectly contributed to adjusting modern techniques in the reforestation program. One remarkable example is Gwangneung, a loyal tombs of Joseon dynasty. During the period of reforestation, the South Korean government used Gwangneung experimental forest in the piloting modern forestry techniques. The topic of pilot studies covered the seedling production, tree planting, forest management, and the mechanization of forest practices. In other words, we efficiently used well-protected forest as a research site to develop our own forestry techniques. These photos show some experiments at the well-protected forest near Guangneng area. 
impact of reforestation program. What happened after the reforestation program? First, forest recovered. The mean stand volume per hectare was only 9.6 in 1960s, but it increased to more than 140 in 2015. The unstocked forest land were reduced from 3.3 million hectares to 0.2 million from 1952 to 007. The reforestation program acted as a basis for the rehabilitation of biodiversity. In other words, after reforestation, plant and animal biodiversity increased sharply. The planted trees also pre prevented soil erosion and provided organic matter by which forest soils become fertile enough for naturally regenerated vegetation to grow. This photo sh shows gradual changes in landscape after reforestation program during 1970s through year of 2000. The total carbon stock was uh, 422 TG in 1954, right after the Korean War. However, it increased to more than 900 TG in 2012 because of the restoration of the forest. The restored forest additionally provided ecosystem services such as disaster risk reduction, water yield enhancements, and soil erosion controls, which are beneficial to human society. If all these ecosystems, ecosystem services are expressed in financial terms, in other words, billion dollars per year, the restored forest have served more than 2.8, 1.0, 0.3, and 0.3 between 1971 to 2010 in terms of carbon sequestration, digested risk reduction, soil erosion control, and water yield enhancement respectively. In other words, after reforestation, all of those ecosystem services increased dramatically in financial terms. In this figure, we see sharply increasing pattern of carbon sequestration from 1960s to 2010. And also uh, we had successful experimental forest establishments during the reforestation program. The South Korean government used to restore the land for forest ecosystem research. In particular, they designated several well-conserved areas as experimental forest where extensive research activities were carried out. Experimental forest can be used as site to assess various forestry techniques and research objectives. Researchers can experiment on forest management alternatives for various purposes using experimental forest, while policymakers can pilot forestry laws and procedures before implementing them on a national scale. One example is a Jeju experimental forest in a small island, Jeju Island. So finally, some conclusions. Experiences regarding sustainable forest management, in other words, traditional and modern community forestry, success of national reforestation, integration of reforestation activity with economic development, and ongoing research and development. These are the some experience we had during the reforestation program. And also I like to stress the importance of community forestry again and songge in old days and salimge during the modern reforestation days. They belonged to countries forest policies concerning 
forest restoration, protection, and utilization. Developing countries have their own traditional knowledge and experience, experiences. Therefore, revisiting it would be useful as cross border strategy toward the sustainable forest management. So if I suggest some uh, drivers for successful reforestation and sustainable forest management, first the driver would be top-down governance. In other words, government provided inferences and also they put the strong regulation to protect the forest after reforestation. And second one would be a bottom up motivation. In other words, we use the traditional knowledge and practices very wisely and use the local forestry cooperative efficiently. And also we had a strong leadership and authorities of the central and local government to implement reforestation program. And also central and local government uh, supported the techniques and financial uh, support to the local villagers to encourage participation of local people for reforestation activities. Uh, these are the uh, conclusions that I have. So I have about uh, 15 minutes left for questions. Okay. I guess uh, Dr. Uh, Park is. Uh, Thank you, Professor Huang, uh, for such insightful presentation. Uh, I would like to now invite Dr. Donggyun Park once again for moderating the Q and A session. So, Dr. Park. Uh, thank you, Professor Song, for making your presentation in a short time, uh, given just 30 minutes. Uh, very detailed explanation. And I have a question from the Deputy Director General of Ethiopian Environment and Forest Research Institute, uh, Dr. Azin Angelo Tenga. Uh, previously, we received already. So first of all, I will ask this question to uh, Professor Song. The Republic of Korea history tells that the country has reversed the severe deforestation and land degradation by deforestation and afforestation campaigns. Today, Korea is one of the world's climate resilient economies with a forest landscape of more than 64 forest cover. How does this achievement realize? Or was this afforestation deforestation effort led by Korea Forest Service? Is it helpful to have forest service in Ethiopia to coordinate billions of tree seedlings plantation and to manage millions of planted areas? Can you answer for these three in short? Yes, uh, thank you for the very uh, insightful uh, questions. Uh, first, uh, I would like to remind you the final uh, slide about uh, uh, drivers for successful reforestation and uh, sustainable forest management. Uh, there are some key drivers such as uh, uh, top down, bottom up, and uh, strong leadership and authority, and finally some uh, support from the government or something like that. So these are the key drivers uh, to make uh, our program successful. And this uh, successful afforestation program was uh, led by the Korean Forest Service. In 1967, our government established the Korean Forest Service and they uh, planned the reforestation program and implemented the program. Of course, 
uh, during the reforestation activities, uh, we heavily relied on uh, other departments such as uh, Ministry of Interior to implement uh, program at uh, local levels. However, in central government, the Korean Forest Service uh, had the key and leading role to implement the program. So I would say that the uh, uh, Korea Forest Service led a uh, successful uh, afforestation program during 1960s and 70s. And the other question was, uh, is it useful to have a forest service in Ethiopia to coordinate the billions of tree seedlings plantation and to manage planted areas? Of course, uh, based on our experiences, uh, Korea forest, uh, forest service in Ethiopia or do such a role to plant trees, to manage the uh, natural and plantation forest. So strong leadership and strong power of uh, forest service in Ethiopia or achieve such a successful sustainable forest management in the future, I think. Thanks. So these uh, are the brief answers. Uh, uh, this will be good enough. And the last one, and Ethiopia move in the Climate Resilient Green Economy, CRGE, path for the last decade. However, it still today faces severe deforestation of is forest lands to other land uses. This situation is serious when sloping terrains are cleared to grow food crops to making lead. What do you advise Ethiopian government from Korean experience? How should the million of, millions of plant areas and the remaining natural forest be managed? Thank you for the uh, very uh, meaningful question again. Uh, I think uh, one of the successful reforestation program in South Korea is related to economic development during the reforestation program. In other words, uh, during the reforestation program, we had a very rapid economic development and switched the fuel source from fuel wood, uh, energy source from fuel wood to uh, fossil fuel. In other words, uh, we did not need to collect fuel wood for uh, energy sources uh, during reforestation program. I totally understand the condition in Ethiopia. However, I would say that not only forestation reforestation program will make the program successful. Combination with other activities, including energy resources or an economic development would be necessary. In other words, reforestation program should be implemented with the other sectors, uh, of course, including energy, economy, so on. And the other point is about uh, artificial forest and natural forest. As you understand, uh, natural forests have high biodiversity and many other advantages compared to artificial plantations. Therefore, we need to have a balance between artificial plantation and natural forest. So we have to consider careful consideration of uh, uh, balance between artificial plantation and natural forest. Based on our reforestation activities, uh, still we think uh, we did not uh, put much emphasis on natural forest during the reforestation. At the time, we put high value on artificial 
carnivorous plantation. However, later we found that the value of natural forest. So now we try to have a balance between artificial plantation and natural forest. So I would say that uh, you need to consider careful balance between artificial plantations and uh, natural forest. That's my short answer to the question. Uh, the Honorable Deputy Director, Dr. Tenga, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh... Okay. Uh, I hope the, you made a good point and the Professor Son answered your all four questions. But if you have more questions, you can directly ask him right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much uh, satisfied by the, um, by the answer and the presentation itself. Uh, wish to have uh, the slides shared because it's important also uh, other colleagues in the research and uh, in the development sector to, to have uh, this experience of uh, Korea and this uh, forestation endeavor and also uh, in the climate change uh, mitigation adaptation. So it is, it is important to have um, the slides, but uh, the, the answers are well addressed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then your other questions we, we will answer later, OK? OK, OK, sir. Thank okay. you. And the other participant, if you have any other questions, you can leave uh, your questions in the chatting. Dr. Park, I read one uh, Oh, yes, question. you can answer it. Yes, actually, OK. From uh, can I do that now? Yes, please do that. Yes. Uh, here is a question. What is the share of the forest sector to GDP in Korea? Do you know how cover now cover from inland or wood product demand uh, these days? First, uh, mm -hmm. forestry sector uh, has less than 1% of GDP in Korea now. And uh, how much wood product uh, supplied by the national uh, domestic forest, uh, less than 20%. In other words, we are importing more than 80% of uh, wood demand from outside. So we are heavily depend on the overseas market. Yes. Any other questions if you have? Oh, I read one more question here. Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you for sharing the very interesting experience of uh, restoring degraded landscape in Korea. Can you please talk a little bit about incentives for cooperative members other than food? Actually, uh, one good example is local nursery management. In other words, uh, we encourage the local people to make a uh, forest nursery near the village and government provided the seed for seedlings. And once local people produce the seedlings, government purchase them and return them to the local people to plant trees near the village. That was a good, uh, incentive for local people, local cooperative members to get uh, income sources from the government while they secure the seedlings to plant trees near the village. So we had similar kind of incentives to encourage local people to plant trees near the village. Thank you very much. Now it's 2.45. Ji Yoon, oh, okay. thank you, Professor. Thank you, Dr. Wong, Dr. Park. Thank you thank again. You. It, it was my great honor again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ji Yoon, it's your... Um, thank you, Dr. Park, for moderating the Q&A session effectively. And now we will move on to the next module, which is uh, next module. and. Please be reminded that you may also leave questions at the chat board um, to be answered at the end of the module, module four. 
So now Professor So Young Chung will provide us his insights on international market mechanism and its role as a window for climate finance. So Pro Professor Chung, you have up to 30 minutes and the floor is yours. And somehow, uh, sorry, some of the secretary blocked me <laughs> speaking <laughs> by using the microphone. Um, once again, uh, Suyong Chang, uh, professor at the Korea University. Let me just uh, share the screen uh, uh, for my presentation. Okay, uh, this is uh, Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, the rules of the Article 6 in implementing NDC. NDC means nationally determined contributions. So uh, my presentation uh, may uh, related to my uh, earlier presentation today about uh, Korea Green New Deal, Green New Deal concept in the context of COVID-19. Uh, in my presentation uh, on the Green New Deal, I indicated that uh, you know uh, Ethiopian government may want to uh, you know ex uh, utilize the current uh, NDC, in other words, uh, CRGE, uh, uh, in order to develop the further government policy measures to address COVID-19 recovery plans. And as in Korea, if there would be a case in Ethiopia then the next question is how would you be able to secure the necessary funding? To support all these uh, further efforts uh, by the Ethiopian government. So in the sense that uh, in developing countries, uh, you may have uh, two options. Uh, first option will be further mobilizing domestic finance resources. And second option will be then uh, maybe you might want to seek for alternate or additional funding from outside Ethiopia. And then uh, my presentation today is about how you can use Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. You know, many people call this as a carbon market um, as a way of actually bringing more financial resources for Ethiopia. So let me show you uh, the text of the Article 6. I also, I assume that uh, you may you may not have uh, seen the uh, text of the Article 6 yet. This will be the first time. This is a sort of the new carbon market as a nickname uh, under the Paris Agreement. How long is it? It's not that long. This is the all that we have for now in the context of uh, how we can use Article 6 mechanism under the Paris Agreement. So this shows that the Article 6 of the Paris Agreement it has only nine paragraphs. Nine paragraphs consist of the several parts. First part, I would say the general principle. Second, third, uh, consists of the one mechanism. It will consist of one mechanism. And then that's a 6.2 mechanism. So it's not that long. If you read things, you can see toward the nationally determined contributions and then international transfer mitigation outcomes, double counting, robust accounting, voluntary, things like that. And then another mechanism under the Paris Agreement, Article 6, comes with pair of four, five, six, seven. We call it as a mechanism. It will look similar to that of the CDM. Okay, I, I think uh, some of you at least may know the CDM. And this sixth, second mechanism 
will be similar to that of the CDM. And then third mechanism, uh, we call it as a non-market mechanism. Somehow, you know, non-market mechanism comes in as a part of a market mechanism. That's because of the negotiation beauty. One country strongly opposed to agree on the Article 6 text unless they would, uh, countries would agree on including this mechanism. So this is a we call non-market mechanism. And then it's a largely not considered in the context of the how we can use the market principles in mobilizing financial resources. But anyway, once again, there are three mechanisms, 6.2 mechanism, 6.4 mechanism, and 6.8 mechanism. And today, uh, my presentation will focus on mainly 6.2 and 6.4 mechanisms. So Article 6, as I said, as you will read uh, later on, that the text that I provided, it doesn't mention anything about the market in any wording uh, in the text of Article 6. However, it uh, indicates the importance of carbon pricing. We read it carefully, emphasize a voluntary cooperation. Nobody will force anybody to use market mechanism. It's up to you. It's up to Ethiopia, no matter whether you want to use it or not. And it presumes to use a market principle, once again, through Article 6.2 and 6.4. So uh, it doesn't necessarily mean market itself, but largely it is associated with the market principles and market instruments. What does this mean? If we read Article 6, then, then we can find out the three implications out of it. First, this could be probably one of the very few, probably the only article under the Paris Agreement, which emphasize, which promotes interstate cooperation to achieve the goal of the Paris Agreement. So Article 6 emphasizes that, okay, countries can work together to implement its NDC, okay? So interstate cooperation is explicitly you know, mentioned in this article. Number two, depending on how you understand this, as I said before, it can be a window for climate financing. In other words, if you use it wisely and creatively, actually you can bring a lot more additional climate financing from not only public sector, but also private sector outside Ethiopia. It's also an important way of ensuring transparency and sustainable development as the Article 6 text itself says so. So in other words, uh, this is the map of Northeast Asia, depending on how you use a market mechanism. This is a uh, you know, fire, forest fire in Siberia. It's a huge forest fire going on because of the you know, global warming these days. And this is the, you know, desertification in, in, in Mongolia and China. And as you can see, Korean Peninsula, South Korea looks green, whereas Northern part looks not green because they are cutting trees a lot. And all this, in order to address all these issues, then you need to develop the new mechanisms, okay? Uh, in terms of economic development and to meet the financial needs you can put market mechanism systems, okay? So uh, uh, role of the uh, carbon markets in, in general, traditionally, you know, involves it's a flexible, cost effective, and then it's a uh, lowest cost mitigation opportunities are available. And then it can expand the range of mitigation opportunities, and then it can help parties to be more ambitious. And then, however, uh, it needs to be environmentally robust. And then they are linked to each other. So some people say that, OK, ETS, emission trading system, is very, very important. And the CDN comes in another context. And the, these are traditional you know, uh, topics that we discuss about in the context of the role of the carbon market. Of course, Article 6 may have these functions as well. However, under the Paris Agreement, Article 6 may have 
additional functions or additional or different implications. Number one, Article 6 only concerns about NDC implementation. No matter whether you engage in the you know, Article 6 transactions, all these outcomes must be used to implement NDC. For instance, Samsung would like to buy credits out of Ethiopia in order to meet their domestic obligations to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And that they're gonna use them, use the credits for that purpose. It is not covered by Article 6. It was covered by the you know, previous Kyoto Protocol, but currently Samsung is not using those credits in order to implement Korean NDC. So therefore, it is not covered by Article 6. So there is a big difference. In other words, central player of the Article 6 mechanisms must be the government, especially central governments. So it should be done mainly through the government, government to government transactions. If we wanna include the private sectors inside, then, then those tra private transactions needs to be further you know, you know, measured uh, through the government you know, instruments. So ultimately then government needs to able to calculate how much CO2 emissions were reduced and that how those reduced outcomes would be transacted, traded each other. So low carbon technology development and transfer can happen ultimately to support the sustainable development. What does this mean? For instance, say I show you a big number of the uh, you know, government budget to support Korea Green New Deal, assuming that Korean government would like right to include one more component of the strengthening international development cooperation with the developing countries. And therefore, assuming that 1 billion US dollars will be available by the Korean government to support the developing countries to address uh, climate change. Then, then assuming that the head of the government, President of the Republic of Korea, would like right to suggest the Prime Minister of Ethiopia say, okay, we have a 1 billion US dollars you know, stimulus package available for you. Okay, so traditionally we have done in the context of development cooperation. Here, uh, he could suggest to Ethiopia, your prime minister saying that, okay, this money will be used in order to promote low carbon development, the CRGE in other words. And then you, we can actually set the baseline and the Korea would like to provide this money for upcoming say five years or 10 years so that if we you know, put the, all these uh, you know, available resources in the right way, then we can say that, okay, amount of the CO2 emission reduction will be made say by 100 units. And then now Korean government may suggest to Ethiopian government, okay, I understand that it's additional reduction in the Ethiopian side. Why don't you just uh, to use maybe 30%, 40%, you know, for the purpose of implementing Korean NDC because Korean emission target says that we can actually use international you know, credits or emission reduction outcome to cover 4% of the Korean reduction target. It should come from the outside. So we can use it actually in order to meet Korean NDC achievement. And then Korea, thereby Korea can report back to UNFCCC. We have been implementing all these plans as we uh, submitted before to the UNFCCC. So in this context, this is a new one. CDM doesn't say that, okay? Uh, it doesn't involve the uh, you know, direct transaction between the countries, but the article six will allow the governments to negotiate on this matter. So this is a uh, euro eventually promote once again technology transfer and then securing additional financing resources for developing countries. So let me just skip uh, some of the uh, you know uh, 
you know, slides. Uh, I will upload uh, this uh, slide later on in the project website so that you can uh, see all those uh, slides. So here, Article 6 is a window for climate finance, therefore. In global climate finance architecture, if we want to talk about the climate finance sources once again, we can think about uh, public sources like uh, ODA, right? And then develop bank type instruments. Uh, if you, if Ethiopia would like to get the, uh, some loan from the World Bank, uh, that will be the case. Private capital, say, uh, these days, off-grid renewals are popular. So, uh, you know, private sectors might want to invest uh, in Ethiopia, then the naturally private money might come into Ethiopia, right? And then carbon markets. Before, carbon markets means that the CDM, and in case of the, between the uh, developed countries, there was an issue of joint implementation. So here, carbon market used to be one of the sources, okay? What I'm talking about today, if you read text of the Article 6 very carefully, actually, uh, that's why I was not calling Article 6 as a carbon market per se. You can design, actually, the, uh, this Article 6 mechanism to bring all these relevant sources all together especially public sources from a donor country, okay? This comes, may come from, from different points. Once again, Article 6 says that it should be used for the implementation of NDC, okay? NDC owners are only central governments, okay? international transfer of mitigation outcome. We call these guys, not as credits, but the mitigation outcomes. And those mitigation outcomes can be transferred mainly by central governments, okay? You can put the different uh, options in this basket. In other words, under the Kyoto Protocol, we, we differentiate carbon market and climate finance. Carbon market was uh, one of the tiny, you know, options available in the climate finance. However, what I'm talking about today is that if you design the Article 6 mechanism very well, then the, you can actually use this concept to bring the various sources of climate finance. So you see the differences. In other words, as you can see here, you can see bilateral agencies like, uh, you know, GIZ and COICA, multilateral agencies, banks like uh, World Bank, and then you see GCF, GEF, UNFCCCC, they have, uh, you know, their climate finance sources. And also another source used to be public private sources, okay? Uh, Carbon market under the Kyoto Protocol, actually, if you know the CDM, sources of the carbon market under the Kyoto Protocol comes from this sector, public private sources, okay? And all others, development assistance, and then new and additional climate finance, so you may know the NAMA project and the CIF and others, right? Uh, there were different uh, you know, sources. And the CDM was one of them. What I'm talking about is that you can, you know, somehow, you know, put all these ones, especially development assistant sources, okay? You can put them, sometimes you can combine this with say GCF funding together, right? And then you can bring these additional climate finance sources to support implementing your you know, NDC, that's a CRG. How to do it? It's very flexible. Article 6 says that there are several conditions. You should, uh, you know, comply with very strong accounting rules. And then it should be used to support the sustainable development. 
there is no double counting. These are the conditions for now. Okay, so uh, of course the detailed rules will be available sooner or later in, from the UNFCC negotiations, but uh, it's very, very simple and flexible. There is no precedence on this matter yet, okay? So uh, then uh, let me just uh, go through, uh, you know, Article 6 governance issues one by one very quickly. Structure of the Paris Agreement. So Paris objective is to keep the two degree target, right? To do so, there is a mitigation, adaptation, finance, technology, and the capacity building transparency requirement. We call these six as six pillars. And there is a red plus, Article 6, loss and damage. Without having this, you can still achieve the uh, objective of the Paris Agreement. But if we would have this, then it will be additional. It will help actually countries to better achieve the uh, target objective of the Paris Agreement, right? So Article 6, says, as I said, nobody will force Ethiopia to use Article 6 mechanisms, but uh, it will be only you know, uh, good for Ethiopia to consider using this. So as I said, there has been the negotiations and then we are now almost the end of the negotiations. So last year, we are supposed to finish the negotiation on the detailed rules of the Article 6, but in Madrid, uh, somehow at the last, last minute, I was there, uh, the negotiation uh, was not successful enough to reach the uh, agreement among the parties. Structure of the Article 6, 6.2, once again, there are some issues pending. And then this is the one of the example uh, that we might be able to imagine. This is a joint crediting mechanism developed by the government of Japan. This mechanism was developed under the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, so this mechanism still needs to be adjusted or changed uh, later on in accordance with some of the detailed rules of the Article 6. As I understand, that's the intention that gov uh, government of Japan has now. So very simple, Japanese government uh, identified the host country, say Indonesia, okay? And they have, they formed a joint committee, right? To develop some of the detailed rules. And then all these uh, technical issues are pretty much similar to that of the CD, those of the CDM, but they are a bit flexible enough. And then they can do so as long as they don't uh, breach against the rules of the Kyoto Protocol. So, you know, they form the joint committee and then there are project participants involved and the, heavy, and the third party entities sometimes validate the project and the verified amount of GH emission reductions and removals. These are done in the case of CDM by the secretary of the UNFCCC, right? But they can do that by themselves. Article 6.2 mechanism can be more flexible than this, okay? So if Ethiopia can identify the good partner, you can pretty much actually design the mechanism by yourself through a negotiation with another country. So JCM might be a good example, but you cannot use JCM as a 6.2 mechanism because this was developed by the Kyoto Protocol, under the Kyoto Protocol, okay? Now we live under the Paris Agreement. So this one needs to be further revised even, okay? And then to do so, one question is a so-called cross-funding adjustment. In other words, four megatons. This is a case of uh, Ethiopia. If we would like to share four megatons reduction to Korea, acquiring party, then Korea's emission reduction uh, in a target will be reduced by this amount. And then Ethiopia, you actually use the four megatons for another country, you end up with increasing your emissions by four megatons. However, you still have leftovers. So it's good, right? You produce uh, textiles and you would like to export them in case actually you have the exceeded amount of textiles available so that you can get the cash out of Ethiopia. Same reasoning, right? It's another kind of carbon product. 
make it simple to understand. Okay, so there is no harm for Ethiopia to engage in this. And this additional four megatons, you know, can be made by using the, some of the additional climate financing resources coming from outside, right? So it will only create the opportunities. And then you need to have a very good accounting rules complied with in accordance with Paris Agreement. That's corresponding adjustment. There are several ways of doing so, depending on the different NDC types of the engaging countries. 6.4, as I said, it looks similar to the CDM. There are some still issues that we need to clarify in the negotiations also later on during the time of implementing this 6.2 mechanism in your country if you want. And then CDM, once again, what is the future of the CDM? You might have a question, not yet decided, okay? Uh, there is a still question whether or not countries will allow the CDM credits, in other words, CERs, to be recognized by the Paris Agreement or not, still on the issue in the negotiations. So there are several options in case of the future of the CDM. So now where we are in terms of the negotiations, once again, I said that we are supposed to finish the negotiation last year in Madrid, but there are still some pending issues. First of all, this is the, you know, there are some pictures that we got uh, from last year. Uh, this is the uh, COP25 venue in Madrid. This is the uh, negotiation room on Article 6, okay? It was one of the most difficult negotiation agenda in Madrid, as I said, that the countries still have not reached the agreement. And the your commissioner and some others are participated in some other related you know, activities. In Madrid, so this shows that uh, you know, negotiation text has been changed again and again toward the last minute. I thought that anyway, we could reach the agreement, but because of the four issues, transition of the Kyoto mechanism, as I said, the CDM, share of the proceeds, you know, the 5% of the uh, you know, share uh, to be used for the adaptation you know, fund of the UNFCCCC, this is still pending issue. Double counting, how to avoid the double counting. Overall mitigation in global emissions, uh, you know, all these efforts needs to contribute to reduce greenhouse gas emissions overall at the global level and detailed, you know, techniques and then details are different among the parties. Because of the four issues pending last year, we are supposed to finish this, this negotiation actually in Glasgow this year, but due to COVID-19, uh, UNFCCC postponed the, uh, you know, this uh, COP meeting this year to next year in Glasgow. So we have to finish uh, these negotiations by next year. If we would finish them, once again, as I indicated, we will have a two mechanisms, 6.2 mechanisms, 6.4 mechanisms. 6.4 mechanism will be similar to that of the CDM, right? It's a small scale of the project. 6.2 mechanisms will be government to government. And then nobody will decide the mechanism itself. It's up to the parties, as long as they comply with the rules on double counting, avoiding double counting, sustainable development, robust accounting rules, and then all the as long as environment integrity, as long as parties comply with these rules, and then uh, you can design the mechanism by yourself. You can put things and then set the baseline, calculate the reduced emission outcomes, and it's up to the countries how much you can exchange it, right? In any kind of form by bringing more technology and finance resources for your country if you are willing to do so. In the sense that I think uh, it will be very good if uh, Ethiopia uh, would put the additional government unit which will handle this issue later on. Then you can uh, you know, use this uh, government unit inside your commission to have uh, negotiations or discussions with the potential donors 
governments and later on some other you know world bank you know deposits some of the mitigation outcomes are coming from developed countries so you know there will be uh, some of the additional benefits that you can create so nobody will force once again ethiopia or any developing countries to introduce this mechanism but as i understand that different from the cdm depending on how you design it it can bring the large amount of the uh, you know tangible benefits uh, to Ethiopia. So at the national level, at the international level, there are some issues that Ethiopia might want to consider in order to grab uh, this good or op possible opportunities under the Article Six of the Paris Agreement. Finally. Uh, these are some of the pictures or some of them you, you already saw uh, that, uh, you know, my group uh, together with the partner organization here and there worked on the market article six of the Paris Agreement. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Professor Chong for your presentation. And now, please welcome Dr. Park once again, who will moderate the Q&A session for this module. Dr. Park. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. Thank you, Professor Zhang. Uh, Professor Zhang explained the critical information on Article 6 of Paris Agreement with uh, concise and useful and various examples. In particular, the Green New Deal announced in the morning and uh, the international market mechanism just presented are closely related. It is also associated with uh, CRGE and is connected to the carbon market. Uh, unfortunately, this topic is too difficult for me also. Anyway, first question. Thanks for your in-depth elaboration of Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. As you might know, Ethiopia has started a comprehensive tree planting program through the Prime Minister's Green Regas Initiative. What should Ethiopia do more to benefit from the market mechanism on the Article Six? Can you answer? Hey, uh, I can. I can spend uh, more than an hour to answer this question. Sorry. <laughs> <But> <laughs> let me let me let me answer in one or two minutes. So first of all, uh, in case uh, Ethiopia would like to use this Article Six mechanism in relation to the forest sector there is a first uh, challenging question, whether or not the forest sector can be used actually to generate uh, credits. I said uh, credits under Article 6 is called as ITMO, International Transfer Mitigation Outcomes. And this is one of the uh, hot negotiation topic in the UNFCCC. So in other words, uh, mitigation outcome, whether or not it would include the issue of the sinks that's related to forestry, and then the Gabon Republic of Korea is very, very active to push actually the, all these member countries to include the things. In other words, to in order to include the forest sector to be covered by Article 6. And then I think likely it will happen, okay? And then number two, to do so, say when you uh, develop the, your you know, planting plans in Ethiopia, First of all, you need to set the baseline, right? And then you need to calculate how much you can reduce greenhouse gas emissions, right? And then in accordance with Article 13 of the UNFCCC Paris Agreement, that's transparency requirement. In other words, in your country, you call it as MRB, okay? Your MRB system must be comparable with that of the UNFCCC, in other words, Paris Agreement. Okay, and then you have your national MRB, and the many of your planting programs and the projects will be done at the local level. 
then your national MR inventory system, in other words, must be able to capture what's going on at the local level. So in other words, it's very, very critical for Ethiopia to develop not only national MRB system in accordance with the requirements under the Paris Agreement, but at the same time, uh, based on that, you need to further develop your sub-national MRB systems. Either those sub-national activities can be automatically reflected on your national MRB system, or you have a different system, but you have a mechanism actually to share the uh, you know, outcomes of the MRB you know, management for the national purpose. So it's up to you, but uh, it needs to be you know, placed uh, first uh, within your uh, government, okay? That's the uh, first step. And then you know, I said, forestry is likely to be included. I'm very positive. And the second, uh, I see, I have seen, observed the uh, MRB activities by Ethiopia. So you are one of the leading countries among the developing countries. I'm pretty certain, okay? So uh, if you cannot have a full MRB system placed in every provinces, I know that some of the uh, provinces uh, in your country already have uh, like a province level of the Red Cross uh, programs and then similar ones. So maybe that could be the first starting point, okay? And then uh, I, I suggest, I indicated that you might want to, Ethiopian government might want to uh, establish a uh, government unit to deal with, to handle the transferring mitigation outcomes that can be calculated based on your national inventory system in the case of transactions who are transferring mitigation outcomes to another country. National MRB system is a domestic one, but the, you need to have a unit which will handle the transactions, trading, right, with another countries. Those on other countries will be likely the governments, not the private sectors. Once again, CDM will used to involve the private sectors to a large extent, as I showed you before. And then Article 6.4 mechanism will bring the private sectors, but ultimately all these things needs to be gone through the hands of the governments. Okay. Paris Agreement is still in the negotiation on this matter. So we don't have yet concrete examples available, but I think uh, it's very good for Ethiopia to think about, you know, uh, transfer the ready projects available, right? As, you know, negotiation would be finished and then you can uh, engage in additional activity to utilize Article 6 right away. So there are some steps that uh, you need to do but once again, uh, I have a very positive uh, response uh, to your country uh, in the, in, about the possibility of the using uh, Article 6 uh, to deal with forest sector. I, I'm sure that it will bring the more financial resources for your country to better implement your CRG. Thank you very much. Uh, the Deputy Director of COICA, Mr. Sin, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Mr. Sin? Yes, okay. yes. Yeah, okay. I understand that uh, you prepared some uh, project uh, in, uh, for 2021, uh, 2021. In that project, you mentioned about uh, some uh, Paris Agreement and, 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 and carbon market and Article 6. So, and I guess there, I do not receive many questions for all this. Uh, topics because it is too difficult. And what do you expect from that uh, project? And can you uh, tell me about your uh, opinion about the 6.2 of Article 6 and why you prepared uh, that uh, Article 6 in that uh, project? Can you explain to us? Yes, the um, of that uh, and others. In, the, in the previous uh, session, the um, our country director briefly indicated that the uh, there is a new uh, project uh, uh, entitled uh, a Forest Rehabilitation Init uh, Program 
in partnership with the GGGI is uh, coming earlier next year for the implementation. Under this program, we do uh, aim to recover the uh, forest uh, around the uh, 14, uh, 13,000 hectares in the selected watershed in the Ethiopia. And that is the uh, main uh, um, uh, project interventions, but uh, in, par in parallel with that intervention, we are also aiming to set up a government structure uh, in preparation of the uh, Article 6 negotiation under the Paris Agreement. So, well, uh, we consider this uh, Article 6 uh, activities uh, support to the Ethiopian government might be the one of some of the initiative uh, to uh, get the uh, Ethiopian government prepared more for the uh, uh, the, um, the the carbon credit uh, transaction in in the uh, in the coming years of the uh, Paris Agreement, but I but I think but as of now we uh, in order to for the Article Six and Itamor uh, to be truly uh, beneficial, I think that a certain safeguard uh, needs to be put in place uh, to prevent the um, some pitfalls that the uh, Plug, uh, pre previous international offset uh, schemes such as the CDM and then CDM and the uh, joint implementation. So uh, there is uh, something uh, uh, to be seen uh, be under this uh, Paris Agreement negotiation because there there should be uh, some rule book for the action happening uh, this uh, credit credit transaction so we will see because um, we do have uh, some years uh, before the our implementation of our project in partnership with the GGGI so uh, we will uh, make a, a design uh, for the uh, our project uh, to incorporate this uh, Paris uh, uh, article 6 activity into our program so uh, as of now I can only hope that the uh, the uh, negotiation process finished soon. So that'll guide us to design uh, more our activity uh, relating to the Article 6. That is all. Thank you very much for your explanation. I hope you can share your ideas with your colleagues and spread your ideas to uh, among your the Koika uh, friends. Thank you very much. Thanks for yeah, your thanks. Uh, support. Thanks. Uh, I still have three more minutes. Any other questions from the participants' floors? Uh, let me let me let me yeah. add uh, some more words. Uh, first yes, of please. all, yeah. I turned the uh, screen mode to be able to watch the uh, many people here, but uh, uh, you know I only see many names, not many faces. I assume that uh, many of you are listening rather than the watching uh, my presentation now. Um, what I talked about the Article 6 uh, might, uh, you know, to you, a little bit difficult, but actually it's not. Uh, it might, you might feel difficult because it, we don't still have yet any precedent case, okay? But uh, I indicated, for instance, uh, JCM can be a basis uh, to design the new mechanism. Okay, uh, in developing world, even Korea used to do that before. We used to use the things that are already available in a very advanced developed countries. But actually, mitigation outcome can be more generated possibly in developing countries. So you should be able to yourself actually to best utilize your products, right? to get uh, maximized the benefits out of it. And the Article 6 only emphasized the voluntary cooperation, right? It's cooperation means that it needs to uh, make win-win situation, right? Good for both. And then it's additional, right? It's not a zero-sum game. It's a win-win situation. And I see that the potential a lot while I have been in the UNFC negotiation as a part of Korean delegation as an advisor on Article 6 uh, issues, okay? So uh, you can still design it, uh, you know, if you are familiar with uh, ETS or CDM, but you can design the completely different mechanism as well. Some developing countries don't have a good, uh, you know, sense of introducing CDM or 
uh, EPS right away, you may not be ready or you may have uh, not good experiences before. And Article 6 is not identical. If I ask the uh, European negotiators, many of them tell me that, okay, Article 6 mechanism is not about linking ETSs. It's not, okay? It can be one of the mechanisms, but it's not automatically, okay? So it could mean something else. As I said, it could be very simple, okay? And then UNFCCC is not that complicated a document and rules that it has. So as you understand, okay, uh, in case of Ethiopia, you belong to the African group and LDC groups in the negotiations. And then Ethiopia may need to follow the, their di general directions, but at the same time, as a sovereign nation, sovereign country, you can also have your own mechanisms, okay, within the category. So in the sense that, uh, you know, just to be the first runner all the time, then you will grab more opportunities, okay? There will be challenges, of course, but you will grab more opportunities in return for taking challenges, right? If you will address all these challenges. So this is uh, my last uh, words uh, in the closing my, uh, you know, responses to your potential you know, possible questions or comments that you may have. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jung. I see many honorable the professors from Hawassan University, Dr. Danabo and other professors. Uh, please make or deliver your opinions in module six and seven. Okay, professors from the Hawassan University. Thank you, uh, Ji Yun. Yes. Thank you. Ian, yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Park, for moderating the Q&A session very effectively. And once again, thank you, Professor Soyoung Chung, for such valuable presentation. So we'll now have a short 15 minutes break. So please be back by 3.45 PM. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. The workshop will now resume. The fifth module of the workshop will focus on policy suggestions to better implement CRGE. Um, please welcome Dr. Innocent Kabenya, Ethiopia Country Representative of GGGI. So Dr. Innocent, you have maximum of 20 minutes and the floor is yours. Let me uh, post my presentation. Okay, I don't see it. I'm trying to get my presentation here. One second. I have to get my presentation. Okay. Can you see it now? Hello. Uh. You can see it, but you need to increase the volume. Okay, good. Just one second. Very good. Okay. Good. Okay. So now I think it's okay. Uh, good evening. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like to say hello to everyone and uh, thank you very much for this uh, time for the presentation. I do have 20 minutes. Do you hear me very well? Uh, yes, we can hear you. But, uh, Innocent, I suggest you use the full screen function of your PowerPoint. Sure, let me use my full screen. Is it okay now? No. <laughs> yes. Oh. Yeah, I think I see the, very good. So good afternoon, everyone. Actually, uh, this presentation is about the project that we talked about in the morning, uh, in the uh, opening remarks. Uh, many people talked about this, and this is a very important project. It's called Climate Resilient Forest and Landscape Restoration Program, uh, which actually came out of the uh, this, uh, series of workshops and program that uh, was initiated by uh, Professor Chang. So we started uh, 2017 and uh, out of uh, uh, work that was done, discussions and understanding the situation in Ethiopia as a kind of policy brief or a result of what you have been doing, we came up with this idea and we submitted this to uh, COICA. So uh, I'm going to present this. Uh, it, it will be just about the project and a little bit about GGGI uh, in Ethiopia. So um, just, uh, I think many people know GGGI Ethiopia, what you are doing, but I'll just go through this very, very fast. Um, about CRG and CRG facility, I think everybody knows that we have been there since 2010 and we participated and supported the government in the preparation of CRGE as a strategy, but also the strategy needed funding. Uh, so we participated in the uh, establishment of CRG facility, which is there running and it's coordinated actually by GGGI. And also we supported some technical and analytical studies, especially trying to get some development of sector-wide system for tracking climate expenditure for the major uh, sectors of CRGE. Uh, last year, from 2019 20, and the last year, uh, and this year actually, we have been working on industrial park, and the whole objective is trying to make industrial parks green or eco industrial parks, as uh, they are mentioned in many documents in Ethiopia. So we tackled three pillars uh, waste, water management, business plan, and reuse in Hawassa IP. 
So we did a feasibility study and we tried also to establish a business plan. Uh, we have finished and this is with the GIZ. So uh, we propose some intermediary actually solutions so that by the time we move uh, to the um, uh, 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 full, when you have like a 17 industrial park, we can be able to have a business model. We prepared this feasibility study of rooftop solar PV because we think that uh, um, Ethiopian industrial park can be able to benefit from the solar PVs. And uh, this was the first one for those industrial parks. It's done also. And we also prepared a greening roadmap for Ethiopia industrial parks because you have industrial parks, but how do you make them sustainable? So we wanted to have a kind of roadmap that we finished uh, with the GIZ always. And also we thought about uh, the climate positive cotton textile supply chain from the cotton to the supply of uh, the finished products, t-shirts, jeans and all that, uh, 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 some uh, uh, industries wanted to have this to understand how much is being polluted along the value chain so that they can be able to reduce the pollution. So we are working uh, on this uh, with um, uh, 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 H and M, uh, and uh, we will continue next year. So we have some projects that are going on. We are trying to do a, a low emission uh, development strategy for Ethiopia to 2050, and this will be a project that will be uh, sponsored by a French development agency, Agence Française de Développement, and also uh, they will be supporting the city of Addis Ababa for a feasibility study of using e-buses as opposed to the fuel buses. And on Article 6, we are in discussion with the headquarters and also um, uh, Sweden uh, to see how uh, we can be able to start actually preliminary preparation as uh, uh, I think uh, um, Professor Chang talked about this very long about Article 6. So we want to have the preliminary understanding and preparation. So we are going to do this year and going to the next year some feasibility study on mini, mini grids in the rural areas to see how rural people can have uh, more electricity because there is electricity in rural areas, but there is more need of electricity. We are also going to have a project on solar power irrigation to sustain, transform Ethiopian lowland agriculture. This is a project that is ongoing on the ideation and preparation. And uh, uh, finally, and sustainable landscape, we have climate resilient forest landscape restoration program that I'm going to present right now. So we have been helping also the government climate diplomacy. Uh, Frank talked about this and uh, uh, also on readiness and NAP, uh, trying to get money from the um, uh, GCF. Uh, currently we have a NAP of 2.8 million that is underway. And um, we work with different uh, uh, donors and uh, for this project in particular, uh, uh, Korea, South Korea, and uh, represented by Koika, Ethiopia, they are the ones that we are working with. So the, the Climate Resilient Forest and the Land uh, Restoration Program, uh, just if you read this uh, quotation that I found from uh, uh, some publication, Ethiopia is facing rapid deforest deforestation and the degradation of land resources. The increasing population has resulted in extensive forest clearing for agricultural use, over grazing, and exploitation of existing forests for fuel, wood, fodder, and construction materials. Even if you were to remove Ethiopia here and you put some other different African countries, you will get the same meaning. And if you look at the place where this uh, text is, you can see that you have like water courses, some lakes, which are totally, uh, whose the surroundings are totally degraded. And you can see the effect of uh, erosion and the waters end up changing. And then at the end of the day, they become, we get siltation and with all the danger that you can have. So our project will be protecting some of these areas, which will be selected actually uh, before December. So uh, the process of this, um, I mean, there have there are several meetings with Koika, Ethiopia, with uh, Korea University, represented by Professor Chang, and uh, we try to see if the idea that we had was aligned with the government uh, priorities and also Koika uh, uh, priorities. And fortunately, uh, we realized by the time we we're discussing with them, Koika was actually uh, aiming at uh, uh, widening its project programs in Ethiopia and have uh, an approach on green economy and climate change uh, response that focuses on job creation, 
inclusion of youth and women, poverty reduction, and also intensive uh, stakeholders uh, consultations. We realized that those merged exactly with what we wanted to do. And then from there, we prepared a project and the whole process started. So what you see here, the picture you see of these very jovial, happy people, uh, this was in January 2020 uh, before coronavirus, when people came to Ethiopia, you could see the team and you could recognize some of, like Professor, Professor Park is there, Professor Chang is there and others. Were, this was at the end of um, facts finding mission because we had to visit some areas in Ethiopia where similar projects are being done so that people can see from them, uh, themselves how it works and all that. And it was very, very good. So the process for uh, approval is going on and we think this will be done soon. And I would like to really thank here, Professor Tang and Koika, uh, Ethiopia, and also the uh, commission. So um, the way I'm going to present this, this project, as you know, it has, um, impacts so what you see above here the two lines these are impacts and um uh, yeah these are two impacts and then if you look down at the columns these are the outcomes and down there i'll show you what will be the output so that you understand what this project will bring out but i would also like to underline that the project will have about uh, uh, if, if everything goes well, we will have 12 million US dollars to do that, and we will cover 13,000 hectares of degraded lands in selected watersheds. So um, the three outcomes are about institutional arrangements, it's about uh, site appropriate technologies and the green finance mechanism. And if you combine all these together, the outcomes will lead to forest conservation and restoration, uh, which will be implemented as 13 hectares, as I said. And then uh, we will also to be able to secure ecosystems that have really totally gone. And this will also have uh, an effect of job creation, climate resilience, and also support green growth uh, uh, as a whole. So you see that this is a small project. Uh, but uh, it will have a very good um, impact and you can see the outcomes there. So the outcomes that I showed you there are, you know, in order to achieve this, these are the, uh, 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 the outputs that we are uh, going to, to get. And if you look at uh, the four outputs, uh, outcomes rather, number one will be about policy framework related to in international transferring of mitigation outcomes. So uh, Professor Chang's presentation that took uh, about 45 minutes, it was about explaining about these uh, international markets and all that. So you see that this project that you are going to implement, it has a lot of emphasis on this and we'll be able to have four outputs, one on policy, another on capacity building, and also uh, MRV uh, uh, roadmap for uh, water, forest, and agriculture. Um, on the uh, outcome number two, we do have uh, uh, institutional arrangement that will, will uh, in terms of like cross sectoral land use planning implementation, because you know that these forests are planted on land. So these have to go hand in hand. As you look at uh, uh, outcome number one, you look at outcome number two. And in order to reach this, we will have about four um, outputs. And as you look at them, it will be a coordination of sector sectors. Uh, for people who have been working with the government, this is one of the main challenges, cross-sectoral coordination, because all these uh, sectors are interrelated, are interlinked. And if you don't do that very well, then you end up failing. Gender inclusion and trying to make people participate from the beginning and uh, benefits, people have to understand what are they going to gain there so that they can be able to get incentive to, to, to do the work. And uh, then, we have to make sure that who's going to do that. So there will be discussion at that level for watershed use associations that will be able to carry out these activities. This is ownership is very important. So the last two, um, the last two uh, outcomes, uh, one, uh, the third one is uh, site appropriate technologies, because in order to have all different sites like uh, being well uh, 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 taken care of, you need technologies that are appropriate. Ethiopia has been planting trees for years, so these technologies are there. So we'll go through capacity building mechanism, targeting forestry and related institutions. We'll do forest illustration applied in, at lower level, we do integration of forest product value chains, 
and also we'll do forest carbon hydrological mo monitoring systems. And the last one, you cannot, in order to have sustainability, you need to think about money. So what happens when this project will finish at the end of five years, we will need to have uh, prepared a way of getting green funding for continuation and covering more areas. So um, in order to have that project, as I told you, we had to see, is it a priority for the government? What do, that, what do the national policies say? And we look at the CRG strategy, climate resilience strategy for agriculture, and NDC, and we realize that three of them, they are actually targeting what we will be doing. So we are in the right direction. But also we said, um, is this project aligned with the national forestry um, sustainable development plans? And we look at the four pillars. If you look here, you'll see that you have four pillars. And under the four pillars, there are things that need to be done. And at each level, you know, from the human capacity development, technology development, to establishment of new commercial plantation, to forest ecosystem services, up to the last one, which is about resource, resource for tree planting, supporting development of forest-based communities, enterprises. In, uh, on the right side, these outputs that you see here, uh, MRV, uh, capacity cross sector, whatever, all these are responding to the four pillars that are in national forestry and sustainable development plan. So we are totally in, the, uh, uh, in, in line with the government plans. For example, if you look at the human capacity development technology development, you see that we will look, focus on MRV capacity at the regional water forest and agriculture water sectors, that is MRV at that, because we have MRV, we know that, but I think at each sector, they have to be strengthened very seriously. And uh, as Professor Tang said, this will be very needed when we start this kind of transaction that we talked about. Cross-sector coordination that I talked about, gender inclusive participatory, capacity building on mechanism, including peer-to-peer, uh, you know, where we tap into Korean experience and also uh, trying to understand capacity building for international carbon transactions. So this is for the human capacity. If you go to establishing new commercial plantation, you know that we will have it, we establish 4,000 hectares of community timber plantation. There will be support value chain integration and financial facility for that based payment through local financial institutions. And this will be done as the output of our project. And if you go to the, uh, down, the, 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 the pillar number three, forest ecosystem services, forest biodiversity conservation, forest landscape restoration, which are really the uh, objectives of the pillar three, we would have 7,000 7, hectares of assisted in new regeneration uh, through ex uh, exclosures as forest and landscape uh, restoration. I think um, when I looked, uh, I tried to read this because this was prepared by foresters and so that uh, it, this is, uh, Exclosures are a lot used in Ethiopia, so this is not a new thing, but the mechanism is already there. There will be modeling and monitoring of carbon and hydrological processes, and also ad hoc financial mechanism support uh, to implement uh, pay, pay for payment for ecosystem services scheme and PPP arrangement. And this will be supporting Pillar 3, and finally supporting Pillar 4, we will make sure that uh, um, um, uh, yeah, the B B BSM at Kebele and community level support forest restoration institutionalize the strength uh, that is like a watershed user association, women and youth forest uh, enterprises. This is in the document, but when people go down on the ground, they see the reality and then they adapt. It's not like establishing something new, it's trying to see what is in there and then uh, work on it. And also we will establish 2000 hectares of community woodlands. Woodlands. If you take the 2000 hectares, 7000 hectares, 4000 hectares, you end up with 13,000 uh, hectares that will be the uh, result of this project. So the project uh, as, as in terms of tree planting and management, they will be divided into three, 4000, 7000 and uh, 2000. So I think uh, uh, given that we are in the period of 
coronavirus, uh, you cannot finish the presentation without mentioning uh, the, the, the benefits that will come out of that, because this is a project that will start next year. And it's planned to involve young people, women, and other people in the rural areas at a level, at a lower, lower level, which means we will be able to uh, create jobs. Uh, and then also uh, the gender equality and social inclusion, because we said the, uh, the nurseries and all these activities leading to forestry and all that, uh, to uh, sorry, forest restoration will be carried out by those people who really need jobs. And uh, uh, the benefit sharing also on the ground activities, we say that we will establish the mechanism, uh, building on the experience and at the end creation and, and the capacity building of community enterprises that will provide services. So um, once you have the forest restored and uh, you can have a lot of uh, benefits, but what is also important is that we are uh, trying to contribute to the uh, initiative that uh, was uh, uh, declared by uh, the prime minister on green legacy. And also you know what it comes out of the forest. Once you do the forest restoration, uh, you can make sure that you have all these uh, products uh, that can be uh, help timber and non timber uh, products that will support the communities and also uh, the outcome that you know for the climate change. So I still have, I think one minute and uh, I would like to stop here and thank everybody who followed this uh, presentation. I just want to mention that uh, I'm not a forester. Uh, so I made this presentation just so what, I mean, this project is going to bring what, but uh, it was very well, very well studied. Uh, the consultations were very, very, very well organized because we did the first uh, uh, consultations uh, with um, uh, all the institutions and uh, sectors that deal with forests. And we were able to get like a consensus really that this is a very good project. And uh, um, then when the team came from Korea for fact-finding mission, we visited World Bank projects that are almost similar and we made presentations and everybody liked this uh, project. So now the challenge is uh, the implementation that will start next year. But uh, GGGI will work with all you guys so that we can be able to have a very good uh, project. It's not small, a 12 million project is not very small. It's actually good. And then from there we can even build up and get more money and you know, more, make more and more uh, land restoration. So I would like to thank uh, the, uh, um, the team that organized it. And uh, Professor Chang again, who really made uh, the idea come out. I would like to thank Koika which is represented here, I saw Mr. Shin. Uh, we worked like closely and uh, we started almost communicating in Korean, you know, because we are together almost all the time. So thank you very much and bye-bye. Uh, um, thank you, doctor, for your um, productive presentation. And now I would like to give the floor to Professor So Young Chong for moderating the Q&A session. Uh, uh, thank you, Innocent, for your presentation. Uh, your presentation reminded me of the, uh, you know, hard time and activities that we had uh, earlier this year <laughs> as a part yeah, of yeah. fact find mission. It was uh, one of the uh, yeah. hardest tasks that I have ever been <laughs> engaged with. And yeah. then I'm very happy to see that uh, most of the words that uh, we are uh, uh, produced uh, still remain <laughs> in your document. <laughs> So, exactly. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm especially very uh, pleased to see your presentation. Um, as uh, Innocent uh, introduced, uh, this is the uh, you know, very likely project that will be implemented from next year for five years by the GGGI for the government of the Ethiopia. And then um, every, almost every component that we have been discussing about is embedded actually in this project document. Right, uh, my presentation on the, what I talked about 6.2 mechanism MRV, actually it's the first component as you may have noticed. Yeah. And uh, what uh, you know, Professor Son and then, then Sawat and then Chris mentioned, uh, they are you know, here and there, right? And then that it's uh, in the context of implementing CRGE 
as a best example uh, to implement actually Paris Agreement by one of the member countries of the UNFCCCC. So I'd rather uh, congratulate uh, Ethiopia uh, to have uh, this uh, very wonderful activity. And then I think that this project will become a, another basis to be scaled up later on to get further funding, hopefully through Article 6 mechanisms, <laughs> right? From different donors. <laughs> Um, yeah, sure. Having said that, uh, I think uh, I see uh, uh, one uh, uh, question uh, from the chat room. Thank you for uh, uh, thank you so much for all your presentation and in-depth explanation. As you may know, currently Ethiopia has aggressively working on tree plant. Uh, let's see, yeah, tree planting uh, programs and the successful implementation as well as for further monitoring and evaluation of this program, I think statistical data with a sufficient coverage of the key aspect of tree planting program will be required. So what should Ethiopia do in this regard? Innocent, can you answer on yeah. this? Yeah, um, actually, uh, thank you very much. What you are saying is totally true because uh, if you really want to do a good monitoring and evaluation, you need to make sure that you have the data that will be able to indicate if you have you know, achieved what you are supposed to achieve or not. So uh, I think uh, given that this project was um, prepared by GGGI you know, with Korea University and uh, 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 guided by Koika, but the project belongs to the uh, commission which has a very able and uh, people who really understand forestry and who have done implementation, all that. And also they have the forestry um, uh, um, uh, unit that is working on this. But uh, if you look at, if I, you are to see the whole document, we have uh, uh, prepared a very well detailed uh, um, uh, if, uh, monitoring and evaluation mechanism that would be followed because this is actually one of the requirements of the COICA because they want to see that the money that was given has reached the result. So we will do that. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, I mean, for emphasizing on that. But I just want to tell you that the mechanism in the project have been uh, uh, prepared so that we can be able to get uh, a very well uh, um, organized uh, monitoring and uh, evaluation. And COICA would have actually a unit that will be also dealing with that. So there will be a very good combination from the technical level COICA and from Ethiopia, GGI and uh, the, the commission and the other stakeholders and be able to get a very good uh, uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, results. Okay, thank you. Um, we have about a minute to go, but uh, I would be happy to take another question if you have. You can just speak out if we want to raise any question. Or as I do in the classroom, should I designate one person to speak out? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Anybody? I think uh, uh, people will start to get very tired today. Uh, you know, we are having the various sessions today. So maybe uh, next time, then we will have another round of the discussions on this matter. Uh, once again, uh, this uh, what uh, uh, Innocent has just uh, presented on is uh, one of the two major goals that this current project has been working on the, for the last three years. And then all our partners are very uh, happy actually to have uh, this likely outcome that will be implemented uh, from next year. Of course, uh, with the uh, very generous support of the COICA, uh, uh, Director Kim is uh, here in this room. I'm looking at, uh, you know, here's, here's a window here. And then we really thank uh, for the COICA uh, for their generous support on this endeavor. So having said that, uh, uh, this is the you know, end of the you know, session. And then now uh, uh, I'd like to give the floor back to the uh, GM. Um, thank you, Professor Chop, for your moderation, moderating the, the module. And now we will move on to the module six, which is on uh, role of university in addressing climate change. So please welcome our first distinguished speaker, Dean Mutunak Tolera of Hawassa University.
Dean Tolera, you have 15 minutes for your presentation. Uh, Dean Matuma Tolera, are you, could you, you share to... your screen? Oh, uh, yeah, I want to share. Uh, 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 Um, Dean, do you need help in sharing screen? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to be on this. So uh, I want to say. Can you help? That? Yes, we can hear you. I think he needs help, actually. Matuma, uh, Matuma, yeah. okay. look down, look down on the green. That is yeah. the share, share street. Or oh, good. Is it now shared? Yeah. It's there. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, so. Uh, uh, I will try to uh, present uh, the uh, under uh, six one of the events addressing climate So uh, next slide. Next, please. Yes. We are not okay. able to hear you very clearly, so can you speak up? Yes. Are you, uh, you don't hear me now? Is it okay? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So, Wendogunath College of Forestry and Natural Resources, uh, uh, which is uh, really a partner in this, uh, in this uh, project, uh, was established uh, uh, over 40 years ago with the aim of um, just uh, training forest technicians. And uh, at that time, it was a diploma program, receiving only like um, uh, about 20 students. And uh, over these uh, 40 years, it has grown to uh, the level of uh, offering PhD uh, program. Uh, and then it has got um, so many experiences in teaching research and community services in this and the areas of forestry and natural resource uh, management. <clears throat> Next slide. So, uh, structurally, uh, Wendogunath College of Forestry and Natural Resources is under Hawassa University. Hawassa University has got uh, uh, eight other colleges, uh, which are almost all of them are. Uh, located in different uh, campuses. And uh, Wendogunet actually is uh, uh, one of the three colleges which established Hawassa University itself. And then um, it is, uh, it's, it structurally looks like, like uh, there is a president there, 
dean. We have uh, two associate deans, one responsible for the academics and the other responsible for research and technology transfer. And then we also have managing director and the academics, the academic units are under the uh, dean for the uh, academic affairs, research, community service and technology transfer is under uh, associate dean for research and technology transfer. And uh, all these are supported uh, by the admin staff, which is under the managing director. And uh, so currently we have uh, about 178 academic staff, which is the detail of which is presented on the next slide. Uh, the, the academic profile uh, is like, um, we have uh, 25 PhD staff at the moment. Most of them are, of course, the uh, lecturers holding masters uh, and masters MSc or MA. And uh, we also have BSc holders. And uh, our aim, our aim in the, next, in the near future is to, re to reach uh, almost like uh, uh, 70, 30, 70% 70 uh, masters uh, level and then 30% PhD in the near future. So uh, with the, B the BSCC uh, holders will uh, soon go to uh, the MSc classes. And then in the, near, in the near future, we are going to have 70, 30 proportion with 70 masters and uh, 30 PhD uh, staff. Um, we have uh, 12 academic units. Uh, most of most of them uh, like uh, are uh, focusing on forestry and uh, other natural resource areas like agroforestry. We also have general forestry, forest management and utilization. We, we also have one uh, department focusing on urban forestry and the greening, uh, <coughs> natural resource economics, GIS, Soil resource and watershed management, environmental science, land administration surveying, wildlife. The two of uh, the last two are focusing more on uh, wildlife uh, and uh, ecotourism areas. So these are academic units uh, that that has got uh, different programs at BSCC, MSc, and the PhD level. Next. Uh, this, this, with this slide shows you about uh, our current the MSc programs that we have at the moment. So uh, I don't, I'm not going into the details. Uh, like uh, um, some, we, we we have climate smart agriculture. We have climate change in development. We have, uh, we have also forest resource assessment and monitoring, which is mainly focusing on uh, assessment of greenhouse gases uh, and. Uh, and we also have renew renewable energy utilization management that's also focusing more on uh, measure measuring or assessing uh, greenhouse gases uh, that are related to uh, energies the energy sector and we also have others which are uh, related to wildlife biodiversity and gis At the moment, we, we have uh, two PhD programs, uh, PhD in climate change and bioenergy development and PhD in agroforestry. PhD in agroforestry, actually, we are going to receive the first batch of students this year. And uh, in total, uh, for um, and at, at the moment, we have about 2000 students. Our, the most of them are uh, BSc. And uh, like uh, the last bar is uh, 25 PhD students. So this is the number of students that we currently have uh, <coughs> uh, at, at our college. So you can, you can imagine uh, uh, that the college started with about 20 students uh, and then now it reached to 2000. Of course, uh, the, 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 the aspiration is to uh, reach more, especially uh, focusing on uh, on the postgraduate uh, studies. 
we in 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 addition to the teaching uh, and then uh, the other mandate is conducting research and uh, community service activities so I will more focus on this uh, these two and especially the last one which is a community service in the last in the remaining time of, of my presentation Next. with research actually we have uh, two streams of research we have we have research that uh, is uh, conducted with uh, uh, regular uh, government funds and that is more related based on uh, thematic based researches. Also, university has got technology village. So this research is conducted in technology village actually. And um, yeah, it's, it has got a kind of multidisciplinary approach where uh, people from different disciplines uh, come together uh, to uh, tackle uh, development oriented uh, problems. The, and then we also have collaborative uh, projects, which we do with uh, other universities in Ethiopia and also other universities uh, uh, from um, uh, over the world. And um, most of these uh, collaborative projects are, uh, again, uh, thematic based. They, they, they address uh, multiple disciplines. And then uh, mostly we do these uh, researches with foreign universities and then some of them uh, uh, training, like PhD in the MSc training is also uh, included. Uh, I think I brought this um, uh, from the, the CRG for famous one. Maybe uh, this, was, uh, this was mentioned several times during this workshop. But the reason why I brought this is uh, 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 you, you see that the, 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 in the CRG, especially with interventions, uh, the country uh, uh, would like to reduce almost 64% uh, of uh, the possible emission. And then uh, about 50% of this emission abutment potential is to come from the forestry sector. So uh, the, the interventions, the interventions that uh, are um, that aim towards forests and forestry in this country have got a lot of implication to uh, to um, uh, the country's uh, green economy strategy. So you can imagine uh, the how the role that can be played by our college and also professionals that uh, uh, that uh, graduated from this uh, college. In, in my next slide, um, I, I want to uh, show that the, the country because of the CRG, in order to implement the CRG, the country engaged in two uh, different interventions. One of these is the Red Plus. And so the Red Plus is actually implemented by Ethiopian Forest uh, uh, Environment, Forest and Climate Change Commission. And uh, with that, we did the, the commission is uh, in its implementation of the Red Plus. Uh, the, we have done a lot of uh, capacity building activities in supporting the countries, the country implements uh, the CRG itself for um, expertise pulled from all over the country. This is not only like uh, um, uh, focused in few areas, it crosses professions and it also uh, aims at capacity building for all of, for all uh, experts all of, from pulled from all the regions in the country. So this is one of the areas through which we are supporting the government, for example, to enhance capacity in addressing uh, or in implementing Red Plus. Next. Uh, this is not only, it's not only the national or the um, uh, federal level one, and, and sometimes based on uh, requests, we can also engage with uh, regions, for example, these two regions, the Southern Nation and the uh, Oromia, they are the ones close to our campus uh, or bordering us. So uh, we do a lot of um, capacity building activities for, for those ones also in Red Plus and also in GIS remote sensing. Not only these ones, I'm, I'm presenting only the ones which are related to uh, the climate change, Red Plus uh, things, but uh, we, we do a lot of uh, 
capacity building activities in all our uh, programs that we have. We we also in, we also engage we also engage in um, uh, in forest inventories. For example, nationally we 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 created platform for the trainings. We also contributed uh, experts which led or which uh, were really consulting the team during the uh, forest inventory, which were re recently done. And we also supported with equipments because like everything uh, here uh, can be used nationally. And uh, we also involved in, in, in committees uh, which are related to Red Plus uh, uh, regionally as well as uh, nationally. Next. Uh, I want to share with you the experience from one of uh, our uh, big project in, in relation to MRV. It is called National uh, uh, MRV uh, Project. Uh, uh, so this is, um, uh, this is uh, through the support of the Norwegian government. And uh, uh, through, this, through this project, uh, we have uh, impl implemented many things so far. It is almost in the fifth year so far and, uh, and uh, at final uh, year, but um, we have uh, uh, done a lot of things with this project. And then I want to share with you on some of the experiences. Next. Uh, like for example, one of, one of the uh, outcomes, one of the areas of um, intervention in this project was building the capacity of the college itself. So through that, uh, uh, like five of our staff are uh, almost finalizing the PhD in, the, in different areas of uh, uh, the, uh, like uh, forest resource assessment and monitoring. This is uh, re in relation to MRV in an area of forestry and then uh, energy and then and also climate smart agriculture. Also about 12, 12 staff have uh, been trained in these different uh, thematic areas uh, from for uh, some months. And there are also uh, research leaves in sabbaticals, which were included in, in this project to enhance the capacity of the college so that the college can uh, better placed in implementing uh, in national MRV capacity building activities. Next. Uh, the, the other is the, yeah, the other is uh, building the capacity, the, 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 the expertise capacity of the, the nationally. So for that, three MSc programs were, were opened through this, um, through this uh, uh, project. And uh, with this, they are all related to the three pillars of uh, CRG, forest, agriculture, and energy. And then through that, over uh, close to 170 MSCs have been trained by the college. Uh, even if the even if the uh, the project is going to be closed very soon, the college has already hand over uh, took over these uh, three MSC programs, and then they, we have already made it part of our regular uh, uh, MSC program. So we'll continue with the receiving students and then uh, uh, building the capacity in this area for the, for the future because this 170 is uh, very small when we, when we look at into the size of the country. Next. Um, the, the project is also supporting us in, uh, in, building, in building different infrastructure in the, the laboratory, and also train short-term training is not only the MSCs nationally, and also we are also doing research on in the field on uh, different sites. Next, uh, <clears throat> the other uh, at at the moment, then uh, our laboratory is uh, uh, is equipped with different um, uh, capacities. We can do greenhouse uh, gas monitoring. We can also do uh, carbon stocks. We can also do growth monitoring to look into sequestration potentials. So uh, the, 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 we, have, uh, we have got almost a very, uh, we have got equipped 
uh, laboratory to conduct those ones. And as we are still building the capacity of our, our lab. The other, uh, I think the other experience, which I should not uh, uh, miss to share with you is uh, the, 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 uh, this specific project itself, the, the climate change, the, pro the project on strengthening the capacity to address uh, climate change on forest sector in Ethiopia, this is specific one, which is supported by COICA and implemented in collaboration with, uh, uh, with uh, the Korea University, and uh, triple GI and the others. So in this project, uh, this project has also done almost uh, similar, uh, similar activities with that of MRV. It supported us with curriculum improvements and also uh, teaching materials, which are being in use by different, in, in different programs. Also, they have uh, supported us uh, with uh, uh, la laboratory equipment, especially uh, which are helpful to measure uh, greenhouse gases, especially carbon dioxide from uh, agricultural fields. And also uh, this, like that of the two days uh, uh, workshop, which has already, which, were, which was also conducted before, is also of paramount importance in building the, and the strengthening capacity of the government officials. and. Uh, uh, there are also uh, supports with regard to uh, research uh, for MSc, PhD, and the staff. So uh, the, the, uh, the, this is also one of uh, uh, the very important uh, projects that uh, uh, I can mention in, in, in this uh, workshop. Next. So this is uh, these uh, pictures which you see uh, in different uh, panels. This uh, the first one, for example, is uh, uh, training for uh, our MSc students uh, by professors uh, from Korea University or from Korea, and then uh, the one which you see uh, under uh, the first panel is uh, also uh, equipments to measure. When when we were uh, handing when uh, when we were receiving support from Koika on equipment that uh, are useful for measuring greenhouse gases, and uh, the uh, the right top uh, also uh, a workshop training workshop which was uh, conducted at Haile uh, Resort in Hawasa, which was very important. The other one also. Uh, like field demonstration of the equipment. So uh, this is the teaching materials, trainings, the equipment, they are all uh, being used with by our students at master's PhD level, as well as uh, by our staff. Last, uh, this um, uh, this uh, is, uh, this collaboration is growing like, uh, you have, uh, you have already uh, uh, seen uh, the presentation from Mr. Innocent uh, from uh, Triple GI. So we are also uh, looking forward to look, to work with uh, Triple GI and others in, in also uh, implementing this project. Next, we have uh, collaborations with uh, many uh, universities uh, all, of, all over the world, all over the world that I can say, and most of them are most of them are in the areas of climate change mitigation and adaptation. Next. So with this, uh, uh, I've, I think I have already uh, showed you uh, that uh, the Wondogenet have. Uh, uh, when the has uh, built its capacity over the last 40 years. We feel that uh, this is uh, already center of excellence uh, nationally in the areas of natural resource and forestry and natural, other natural resource uh, management areas. We are supporting other universities. There are, there are other universities have, uh, have also opened, for example, uh, BSc and MSc programs at different levels, but uh, this college is being used as a hub to build uh, the, their capacities. We are training the staff of other universities to masters and PhD level in, in these areas. 
and also uh, our staff are supporting uh, these uh, new universities in uh, in uh, curriculum development and other things. So uh, uh, the experience which is built at Wondoganet in this area is uh, very huge, I can say. And um, we are we are expecting to even uh, build more in, in in the new areas, especially in, in, in the energy and the climate smart agriculture areas through the through the support from uh, uh, the MRV program. Uh, so uh, uh, so we are, we feel that we are already like a center of excellence for this, but we want to. Uh, get accredited in the, for, as a center of uh, excellence in uh, MRV and other forest management areas, not only nationally, but uh, also at East Africa level. So we, for that, we are working with um, Professor Chang through this project. Uh, and and uh, we are expecting uh, some outcome very shortly on this one. So the commission is also very helpful, helpful on this. They have already uh, attested that they they support us, they help us in any in any uh, activity or in any journey uh, that Wendoganet is doing to re to reach to that level. And uh, uh, so the, uh, the university is also uh, supporting us. This is already in our uh, uh, plan in, 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 in for this year. Uh, so this is what I can share with you. Uh, thank you very much. So this is Wondoganet. Um, thank you, Dean Tolera, for your presentation. And now we'll like to welcome Professor David Kies of King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. So Professor Kies, you have 15 minutes for your presentation and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so colleagues, first of all, I would like to begin by congratulating uh, the Dean on founding Wondo Gannett and on building up to 2000 students in 40 years. In contrast, I will uh, describe a university that started 10 years ago and has now about 1,000 uh, students, and of which I was a founding dean and uh, which uh, we have been hosting Professor Chung at in, in recent times. Uh, so he was familiar with uh, our very similar philosophy of sustainability and of being a national resource and ultimately an international player in addressing climate change, energy, and many other issues. So it's my pleasure to give you a, a very quick tour of a university that uh, actually is, is much more diverse than agriculture and forestry. I myself am a computational mathematician, but I have a good overview of the purpose and uh, current status of the school. So uh, thank you for your kind attention. Uh, so KAUST is one of uh, several universities that was started about a decade ago purpose-built science and technology universities. You can see in green here countries that previously did not have major research PhD programs in science and engineering, and also three countries in red, which although they were world leaders in many forms of science and technology already, decided it was time to start a graduate-only S&T school uh, more or less, uh, you could say, in the MIT or Caltech brand with major international partners, ambitious new missions, particularly in energy and environment, and uh, initially strong political support. So KAUST is one of these. I, I will present four pillars, uh, four paradigms, and four strategies in our first decade, and then show it with some data what these have landed us up with, and then describe one particular feature of our university, which I have personally uh, helped develop, which is computational science and engineering, which you should think of as an enabling technology for all of the other sciences and engineerings, whether they be in forestry or in bioengineering or in nanotechnology or whatever. So part one, uh, our pillars, paradigms, and strategies. 
So here is the logo of our university, and uh, I will interpret it in four different ways. I will interpret it as representing the four research pillars, uh, energy, environment, food, and water. By the way, these are seeds in those pastel colors, and that's a lens that uh, indicates the, the scientific study of these uh, four seeds. The way I prefer to think of our logo is in terms of the ways of knowing, the ways of doing uh, scientific discovery and engineering design, namely theory, experiment, simulation, and big data. And as I've animated these four ways of knowing, I've put a timeline above them so that you can appreciate that theory is really a couple of millennia old, going back to the Greeks who theorized a lot about the atomic structure of matter, but did no experiments. Then we could say modern science began with Galileo and the corroboration of theory and experiments a few centuries ago, and simulation about 50 years ago, mainly in the US Atomic Energy Commission at first, and now big data, which is such a commercial success that all five of the largest companies in the world listed publicly are essentially big data companies worth a total of $4 trillion between the five of them. So a very recent addition to our ways of, of doing uh, science and policy. So most of the world's great research universities were founded after the Humboldt model in Germany in the 1850s, where graduate education and research were unified. And uh, only a few universities have been started since the addition of the last two paradigms, which means that most of the world's great universities are, if you will, firing on two cylinders in the way they are academically structured, budgeted, hired, populated, and, and oriented in their degree programs. Whereas Kaust and some of these modern universities built downstream of the revelation, uh, revolutions in simulation and big data have what I like to say a four cylinder approach to their research. So Kaust, uh, when it began, uh, had four strategies. The first of which is multidisciplinarity. The second of which is having some big sisters to get started and get a fast start in world-class research a focus from the very beginning on entrepreneurship in the way the campus was architectured, in the way partners were sought, and finally, a focus on acquiring major facilities in order to attract world-class research faculty and students uh, to get access. For instance, we started with the world's 14th most powerful computer for just one university. Uh, and that, that certainly attracted me. Uh, our, the multidisciplinary strategy uh, is really a way to, to advance faster than the existing universities by going where they haven't been able to go easily to the areas between traditional disciplines. In particular, science and engineering are administered together. They're not in separate colleges under separate deans. They're equals, they're not rivals. They build upon one another. Mission-driven research centers were created outside of the departments. And that's where the major funding of the university goes in order to attract the scientific collaborations of uh, the departments who make themselves useful by addressing these missions in energy, environment, food, and water. And therefore, disciplinary territori territoriality is reduced. The people are not interested in building silos, uh, becoming the world's best chemistry department, but becoming the world's most useful chemistry department in terms of uh, these missions. This is a picture of how we stand today with 11 research centers listed down the left-hand column, and three academic divisions, biology and environmental, science and engineering, computer, electrical, and mathematical, sciences and engineering, SEMC, and physical sciences and engineering. So these are administered by separate deans because it's useful to have some disciplinary specialty when, for instance, evaluating faculty for promotion and so forth. But basically, these centers uh, are, are where the projects are located and uh, the, the divisions supply the people as they can make themselves useful to this matrix managed enterprise, a research university. Uh, now the second strategy, which Kaust was able to afford very, very fortunately during a period of, of high oil prices and expansive ambitions for the kingdom of Saudi Arabia was to attract to the formation of the university 
many uh, leading international university departments. For instance, Berkeley is considered number one in mechanical engineering. We gave them a contract to hire our faculty in mechanical engineering to host them before the campus was complete, to host students on internships while the labs were being built and so forth up and down this list, Cambridge in biology, MIT Woods Hole in marine science and so forth. We went to what we considered the world's leader in every, in every science and engineering field and said, you come build one department. We didn't give the whole thing to MIT like Singapore did, like Russia did and so forth. We picked, we handpicked uh, the departments that we wanted to grow the dirt coast that we wanted to have. We also gave smaller research grants to individual experts from around the world who represented fields that we wanted to grow into, like uh, for instance, uh, battery technology or uh, green cement or clean combustion, uh, uh, things like that, that would uh, plant uh, pieces of, uh, you know, centers of expertise uh, within the campus. The third strategy was to engage from the beginning uh, multinational corporations by building them a park. So within our large campus, we set aside about a third of the campus to host industries that wanted to locate their research efforts within the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the Middle East more generally. And they were given privileged access as early tenants if they would bring their research to our campus. This is very useful because students can stay within their dormitory and do an internship just across the campus with a major multinational like IBM or Boeing or Siemens, et cetera. And uh, at the bottom, you see four Saudi agencies, most of which did not exist when KAUST started, but when KAUST began to draw these international partners to the country and create the sustainability technology vision, uh, these parts of the government were created. The King Abdullah Petroleum Studies Research Center, CAPSARC, the King Abdullah Atomic and Renewable Energy Center, KCARE, and the Industrial Clusters uh, Program. <clears throat> We want uh, that uh, our, our campus will, will uh, be driven by industrially translatable research. We provide students and faculty and postdocs with short courses, with seed funding, with expert staffing for intellectual property protection, patent filing, fundraising, and so forth, to be venture capitalists in a country where almost all the investment used to go to malls and real estate, and now attracting it to research and development. Uh, and just as an example, as I mentioned I was a founding dean of our first five startups, four of them were in the IT sector. IT doesn't take much effort to, and doesn't take much money uh, to get started in. Uh, but these are most, you can see the variety. Two of them were started by students, one by a faculty member, two of them by research staff. In fact, one of those staff was a high school science teacher who invented a waterless cleaning for solar collectors. And that company is now very successful, has raised millions of dollars because water is scarce in the place where you can most profitably put solar collectors, namely in the middle of deserts. Uh, our facilities are world-class, supercomputing, scientific visualization, cave, nanofab, DNA sequencing, mi electron microscopes and NMRs in imaging and characterization, a marine going vessel, a greenhouse for plants, a mouse house for animal experiments, and of course, a, a machine shop. This is our favorite facility. This is the Red Sea. Uh, it was a previously undiscovered, it's the, really the last undiscovered body of water on the earth, rather tightly guarded by a handful of countries that don't trust each other very much. But Saudi Arabia has about half of it by land border. And uh, we have collaborated with Woods Hole in discovering it together and publishing a lot of very influential science papers and attracting the world's leading marine scientists as a result. And this is our vessel to uh, plumb the Red Sea. This is our supercomputer on top and our uh, some students in our visualization cave, a six wall cave in which you walk in with glasses and immerse yourself and explore various things like you know, the cells in the human brain or the flow patterns in a furnace that you're trying to make more efficient or, uh, you know, chemicals in a, in a biological soup or whatever as they're being stimulated. You can't just buy equipment, you have to train experts to use the equipment. So this is the supercomputing lab staff. It was trained by IBM and brought to KAUST at the very beginning. 
I'm very proud to mention to my Korean colleagues here that the director of this laboratory was recruited from KISTI, the primary uh, computational facility in Korea. We were able to attract him to a bigger computer uh, at KAUST, and he has built and trained a wonderful staff. So you in Ethiopia have found uh, a, a very a good national partner, in my humble opinion, <laughs> so far. Well, what has happened in 10 years? Uh, we have about 150 faculty, about 1,000 students. But the, the major thing to point out is that the students are matched nearly one for one by professional researchers early in their careers, about 500 postdocs and 300 research scientists. That includes the people who run these uh, facilities. Most of those research scientists are PhD trained in their areas of expertise. We are, are living together with about 7,000 of our family and community support members. The university employs about 2,000 of those. We have more students in our school than in our university. <laughs> We've had, uh, you know, the young, uh, the young members of the team have had a lot of children. <laughs> we draw our community from 110 countries uh, and the workforce includes 80 countries. The other 30 are where the students are from. And we already have about 1300 alumni, a good number of whom, although they came from around the world, decided to stay to live, work and play in Saudi Arabia, which they found to be a very supportive economy for their scientific and engineering endeavors. Now I'll show you this pie chart to indicate that per faculty, if you, if you do the divisions of these numbers, we have about six students, two and a half postdocs and two research scientists, about near, nearly 11 researchers per faculty. This is, I believe, unusually large compared to most of the world's research universities. And you should keep that in mind when I come to a slide in, in, in a couple uh, here. But first I'll mention that it's not just giving degrees, it's filing for patents, mostly in the US and the UK systems, which are viewed as having the best patent protections. It takes about seven to 10 years for a patent to progress through to a licensing agreement, and most of them never make it. But after about 10 years, we have about 15 royalty generating license agreements they're not making billions of dollars like new drugs, but they are influencing the sustainable technologies that we want to produce. And we have started to raise funds from industrial corporations, not just to come and live and work with us, but to actually fund research on our campus. Now, this is the 2019 QS World University Rankings. And on the right, I'm filtering this chart by citations per faculty. So look who is first, KAUST. Citations per faculty in the world in 2019, by the way, for the last six years, has been KAUST. Now I mentioned we have so many researchers per faculty, so we're sort of set up to have a low denominator and a high numerator. But in fact, if you compare it to the world's uh, most prestigious um, research institutions that are located in the US, my home country, within 10 years, KAUST has, uh, outpaced them in their productivity. So we're very proud that these strategies, especially I think the strategy of multidisciplinarity and going after new areas where people are, are interested to be drawn in is a good one. Uh, we are curiosity driven. So we have two sources of funding. The faculty can plan their research on a five year rolling horizon. They can make a commitment to a student and take and bite off a big long-term project. But mainly the funding is goal oriented. If they want to really uh, load up on their research uh, team, they have to apply competitively, be ranked, and uh, then join one of these translational uh, sustainability campaigns. We are of global DNA. This is a big advantage. I don't know any other university that is not majority built of people in its host country. Coast is drawn from around the world. There is no cultural majority. There is no group think. If you're from Poland, if you're from Mexico, if you're from Ethiopia, if you're from Japan, you all have an equal footing in deciding what the university will do and how its academic programs are organized. And your own uh, special perspective is, is welcome. It's, by the way, 36% women by students. I don't know of any other university in the world 
where the Graduate School of Engineering has 36% women. I came from Columbia University. We had 26%. We are very proud to be one of the highest in the US. But KAUST is very gender diverse as well. We're collaborative across the campus between departments. That's the hardest part. But also across the country with other universities and across the globe with universities and com companies. As I mentioned, multidisciplinary and entrepreneurial and living together work with play. We all have our students go to the same school. We go to the same hospital. We buy food at the same store. We are a picture of the UN, if you will, within one 45 square kilometer campus. Now I'd like to conclude with what I think is one of the secrets of the university, which is our computational science DNA. Uh, we were built around a supercomputer to do simulation and data analytics to help steer the experimentation. Experimentation is expensive. Computing is cheap. If you can ask the questions on the computer, you can direct your scientific investigation, your field work, your laboratory work, which is slower and more expensive uh, in, a, in a strategic way. Now, simulation has been growing rapidly over the last few decades. One way to measure it is by the Gordon Bell Prize, which is awarded every November to a team that, that uh, crosses a new boundary in computational power. Uh, one way to look at this is how many gigaflops, how many billions of operations per second you can get for an investment of so many dollars. And over the last three decades, computational uh, power, uh, uh, the cost of putting a computer on the floor has gone down by a factor of three orders of magnitude per decade. So that my cell phone here is much more powerful than Harvard's fastest computer on which I did my PhD. <laughs> much more powerful and has much, much more memory as well. Uh, the other thing to look at is what you can do with that computer. So over three decades of Gordon Bell Prize, every decade we could do a thousand times more computing per second. And we could also compute for longer periods with less energy, leading to much more capable simulations. Now compare that to agriculture. Let's take a date. That's Saudi Arabia's favorite export. And today at $16 a kilogram, a date is a specialty just to be reserved for eating. But suppose you knew that in three years, that date harvest would, be, would only be $4 a kilogram. You would figure out to go through the recipe book and the, and the uh, food processing plant and replace all the other expensive sugars from cane, from corn, whatever, with date sugar, because it's, it's the natural cheap way to go. Suppose you knew that by 2026, that date would cost you just a dollar a kilogram. You would figure out how to feed uh, animals with it. You would figure out how to create biopolymers from it. You'd decide, you'd figure out how to create plastics from it. Suppose that this trend continued, you'd eventually use it as a fuel or as a paving technology. So what's my point here? Not that dates are on this curve, but that computing has been on a curve much better than this for much longer than this. And in many ways, the rest of the world knows this. Bankers know this, Hollywood knows this, businesses know this, communications companies know this, transportation companies know this, but scientists and engineers don't know this. Scientists and engineers are very conservative. They keep doing their research in the old way. They don't trust computing to take away their turf. Well, KAUST was created to, re to reverse this cultural prejudice and to make a premium on reproducible, uh, reproducible computing and to uh, really try to change this scientific prejudice against the tool that scientists actually invented. Now think of other technologies and how they compare with computing. If we had planes flying a thousand times faster per decade for the last two decades, then the 15 hour flight between New York and Tokyo would require only 1 20th of a second. Did we have that improvement in the aviation industry? No, it still takes 15 hours. And by the way, even if we had it, we'd still wait three hours in the airport <laughs> for our 1 20th of a second flight. But that's the IO problem. That's, uh, that's still slow busy. If similar advances in storage had been created in the library or uh, you know, bibliography industry, then the entire US Library of Congress could fit in our offices. Can we do that? No. 
if similar reductions in cost had been applied to the educational industry, then at, uh, um, then the uh, uh, cost of um, school in the US today, which is in the $50,000 a year range, would be about 20 cents. That cost improvement has not come to higher education, but it has come to computing. And this is because simulation has become an imperative to do things that other fields find more difficult. For instance, some experiments are controversial ethically. Some experiments are dangerous environmentally. Some experiments are prohibited legally. Uh, some experiments are difficult to instrument engineering wise. Some experiments are just too expensive to build like the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor being built in France right now by more than half of the world's taxpayers. It was supposed to cost $4 billion. It was supposed to be done a few years ago. It's now costing $22 billion. It is not finished. Nobody knows when it will be finished or whether it will work. But uh, computing is, uh, is charting its, uh, its path. So there are really two frontiers in simulation. The traditional one is to do uh, more and more exciting problems for a small number of very smart people. The one that we're targeting is to make computing a commodity for people who are experts in something else like chemistry or biology or atmospheric sciences so that we can host them and get them productive. Now, one example is Saudi Arabia's number one industry, the oil industry. You see here on the upper right, a map of the major reservoirs of oil and gas in Saudi Arabia. And you see the world's largest reservoir, Gavar, which has been delivering 5 million barrels a day for about 50 years and still pumping. And uh, that Gavar is very well studied computationally. Uh, you see it imaged on the left. And one way that uh, computing is helping the Saudi oil industry is by getting more and more resolution. So on the left, you see what they could do in 2010. Uh, that's a little tiny bit of a two-dimensional view of an oil field where the oil is in red and the water is in blue and the, di the diamond wells are water injection and the circular wells are oil production and the water is injected to drive the oil towards the wells. Well, oil and water don't mix, they finger. So what happens is the water goes around the oil and leaves pockets of oil that cannot be picked up by those wells. And the computer forecasts that this would happen. And then the, uh, those two circles on the right, when the computer was a thousand times more resolved, uh, 10 times more in every dimension, north, south, east, west, up, down, so that it could build a more resolved model, it said, aha, I predict you left behind these big fields of oil. So they drilled a horizontal well, they found the oil, and that pays for a lot of computers. Uh, this is, yeah, am I done? Oh, yeah. our time is almost elapsed, so could you pick yeah. up okay, fine. So I'll, I'll, I'll just end with this picture. Since this is a, a, a meeting about climate change, we have a Nobel Prize winning climate scientist at Kaus, Gira Stenchikov, whose specialty is aerosols. Uh, how, how the world's atmospheres transport aerosols from one country to another, maybe deposit the desert in the ocean or whip salt from the ocean onto the desert or whatever. These are very important uh, things to understand for renewable energy, for agriculture, for um, international treaties, for deciding what countries we need to help. For instance, if we burn down the Amazon, are we polluting Africa? <laughs> by the winds. You know, these are important uh, questions to run models on. We don't want to do the experiment. We want to do it by simulation. And so that's what GIRA is about. And this is our overall uh, computing agenda. I won't go into the boxes which describe uh, the modalities, the math models, the sciences, and the customers at the bottom. But I will just conclude by, you know, trying to inspire you that instead of building ivory tower universities we should build entrepreneurial universities. Instead of building the tallest silos, we should cross the silos and translate science to sustainability. And when you do that, you have a chance to leap over the existing universities and research establishments that are very successful in their old ways and not very willing to change. So shukran from the shores of the Red Sea. Thank you very much. 
from uh, my, my base of operations uh, in the US during COVID-19. And my best wishes to uh, our community. Um, thank you, Professor, for your presentation. Uh, sorry for interrupting. No, I'm, I'm glad you called my attention to the, to the escaping clock. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Professor. And now I would like to once again invite Professor So Young Chung for moderating the Q&A session. Well, um, I think uh, uh, if, if uh, we want to have a uh, full discussions on the, you know, very uh, related issues that you might want to raise, then, then we need to stay all night long. Uh, it's, uh, it's, we are heading toward the uh, 11, 10 p.m. here in Seoul. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, uh, let me just uh, try to be brief uh, by, you know, thanking uh, for both uh, Dean Mutuma and Professor Kies for their presentations. Uh, I myself has been associated with uh, KAUST for uh, some activities for the last uh, several months and realized that KAUST uh, can be one of the very good model for the universities in Ethiopia. And actually, there are two daily flights, direct flights between Addis Ababa and Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. It's not that far, it's very uh, you know, close to each other. So I just thought that uh, there could be a way for two, you know, Ethiopia and Saudi can work together on the, some of the common interest areas. And, and I do hope that this was the uh, first uh, you know, opportunity for both not only Hawassa, but the Ethiopia in general, also not only Kaos, but the Saudi Arabia in general to find a common way to explore together in the near future. So uh, I myself can further facilitate some of the uh, collaboration or communication if necessary between the organizations or whatever stakeholders in the two countries. And then as we are running out of time, unless you have any burning comments or questions, I'd like to close uh, this uh, session by thanking both uh, Dean Mutuma and Professor Kies for your wonderful presentations. So uh, thank you very much. David, I, I do appreciate uh, your presentation. I know this is your first day of the semester. You are very busy today, but thank actually, you very much. Actually, for those who aren't aware, the work week in Saudi Arabia is Sunday through Thursday. So we got started with our new student orientation yesterday. Oh, uh, we'll yesterday, I see. <laughs> and I have four different uh, orientation presentations this week. But thank you very okay. much for your flexibility in putting this into a convenient time. If it's 11 in Seoul, it's after business in Saudi Arabia. So I was free at this time. And thank you for your flexibility. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Motuma. Yes. So uh, now I would like to hand over the, uh, the microphone to uh, the Jiyun again. Um, thank you, Professor, for your moderation. And as to conclude our workshop today, we will now invite representatives of co-hosting organizations to draw lessons from the workshop series for the last three years. So please welcome once again our distinguished participants, Professor So Young Chung of Korea University, Dr. Innocent Kabenya of GGGI, and Dean Mutuma Tolera of Hawassi University, and Dr. Dong Gyun Park for, of CSD Lab, and Dr. Sarwa Choudhury of UNDP Seoul Policy Center. Uh, hello again. Uh, I'm supposed to moderate this uh, final, but a very uh, quick session uh, before uh, we uh, start to have some discussions uh, in this session that I would like uh, Sarwa uh, just to join. Thank you very much. I was wondering whether you would be joining this session. So uh, the purpose of this session is to wrap up uh, uh, our last three years activities. And then I would like to ask each partner organizations to share your final you know, thoughts on the, what we have achieved and uh, what's ahead in front of us uh, in the coming years, okay? I know that you have uh, a lot of things to say, but uh, thinking about the time, especially in Seoul, 11, 15 p.m., I hope that uh, your statement will be brief, as brief as possible, but uh, having good implications, right? So now, uh, in a reverse order uh, of the program, I'd like to invite Sawat as the first speaker 
uh, you know, to, to share what, what you feel about what we have done for the last three years and then in the future, what we will do. So our floor is yours. Sure, thank you, Professor Chong um, and uh, your team uh, and also all the co-hosts of uh, today's webinar and colleagues in Ethiopia and of various speakers for a very engaging discussion today. So since our morning session, I've been listening to some of the presentations on uh, live stream and they were all very informative uh, presentations and also followed by very good questions. So um, since Professor Chong requested that I come in um, in the end today, so yeah, it's 11.15 p.m. in Seoul now, but I think it was a very good, yeah, it's a well time well spent. And um, I want, also wanted to say that uh, from the UNDP Seoul Policy Center and from UNDP overall, it's been a very good partnership with us, uh, for us uh, to be involved in this um, quicker supported projects with Professor Chong and your team. And the other partners, we have uh, been, um, you know, we have produced uh, knowledge products um, and uh, on forestry issues. We have participated in various uh, climate COP events and presented um, on our work. And it's always been a pleasure to listen to the Korean, ex um, sorry, Korean experts and the Ethiopian experts. And um, today was the same. And um, so, yes, yeah, so I just want to. Um, say thank you uh, for this opportunity to be involved and also that uh, we do look forward to our future cooperation. Um, so yeah, thank you and good night. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Now, uh, Dr. Park, uh, I know that uh, you have been speaking a lot today as a moderator, so <laughs> maybe, but still, I, I think uh, you still have uh, something to add actually as a speaker now. Uh, for the past three uh, years, Hawassi University has been working very hard to lead this project. And Professor Don Gilking and Professor Denabo, and most of all, Dean Motuma has demonstrated remarkable leadership. But still, you should have worked a lot of to do. Remember, in July 2, 2019, the Ethiopian government planted 300. 50 million trees in just 20 hours, in 12 hours. Uh, I guess still, you uh, at this point, uh, you have a lot of things to do. To plant trees, 20 million hectares of forest until 2030, one must produce uh, uh, high quality young seedlings in large quantities. It is necessary to build an advanced nursery at Hawassa University and spread this production system nationwide. They can mass produce the links suitable for the locality. And also it would be best if you produce experts and researchers and government officers and share the knowledge with the local people as well as neighboring countries. And I recommend maybe you can set up or create a high level policy program run by Hawassa University. They can provide a up-to-date information and international trends on climate change, forest issues, and carbon markets. Now, who is going to do this? I believe this is my, maybe the Dean Motuma's mission. Uh, then who should you work with? Financial and technical support from World Bank, maybe UNDP, and TGGI with Dr. Innocent, maybe Koika, Dr. Kim Dongho, and maybe Mr. Singh. Uh, and finally, maybe the role of EFCC is more important. And the, the chairman of of EFCC is essential. When all these corporations and efforts come together, you can achieve green Ethiopia in 10 years later. And Hawassa University will be at the center of it. And the Motuma, you will lead all this uh, program. And then Koika, and also the Dr. Zhang will support this program. Now I believe for these three years, the objective of this project is achieved. 
and we have still six more months, but the mission is complete. And thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Bark. Uh, as an expert, uh, he has been the country himself uh, to a large extent uh, to implement uh, this project. And he never said no whenever I asked him to help me on any matter. So having said that, thank you very much for your you know, friendship and then your dedication and then, then your guidance all the time for all of us uh, up to now. My pleasure, any times. Okay. Now, uh, I'd like to invite Dean Mutuma uh, for your final words. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think um, I've uh, included some of it already in my presentation, uh, that uh, the whole objectives of uh, this project were uh, uh, very much in line with uh, our, our goals and missions, which are more uh, rotated, rotating about, around uh, teaching, uh, research and community service. So I can say that uh, the uh, different activities of this project have touched upon all these missions and goals, and they were also very fruitful. And uh, I, 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 I want to also mention uh, the, the effort through this project, uh, uh, the effort made to uh, bring our college to international uh, uh, um, level uh, conferences like COP, where uh, the activities of our our, uh, pro our college was also presented. So uh, I think the most important thing which I want to uh, emphasize and which we learn it, which others in this uh, room also uh, should, uh, I think, take a note is that this project was a three years project. And even under difficult situations like the, the pandemic, we have uh, held this is a second online event. So it was very strict and um, uh, on time. And uh, I think uh, the timely accomplishment of projects is something that we can uh, learn from lead your real leadership, uh, Professor Chong. Thank you for that one. And um, this, is, this is not only for our college specifically, but the issue of climate and forest is, uh, uh, is also uh, very uh, critical for, for our country. This is where we are really intervening at high level. Uh, so this high level workshop is, which in, involved capacity building for government officials was is, is really a very good model that, that which, is, which needs to be uh, scaled up. And um, of course, this is already taking us to another new collaboration and we have to really uh, look for even more collaborations between uh, uh, Korea University, like uh, uh, what Dr. Park said um, a few minutes ago, uh, more collaborations of capacity building, sharing exp Korean experiences in, in the areas of forestry in more elaborative way, and reaching this out to the ground, the grassroots level, and to other even collaborators with us is very important. Our, col our college and our university, I can uh, also uh, say our university as a whole, will, will always be very uh, happy uh, for uh, what have been achieved so far. And uh, this, this led a very good foundation in our, in our college. And we look forward to work with you all in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dimo uh, um in Motuma has been always uh, dedicated to implement this project. I know that the uh, request that we post to Hawaza University, partially because of the requirements of the Koika, have been very, very strict. And uh, he never uh, said no, right? Uh, he knew how to find out the solutions to address the challenges. And of course, uh, we teamed up to do so, but without his uh, leadership, even without his network that he has in Ethiopian society, I don't think uh, this project could uh, could have achieved the uh, planned goals that uh, we did actually now. So having said that, thank you very much. Now I'm very pleased that uh, I, I found the friendship actually in Ethiopia from you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, I know that uh, Innocent uh, doesn't like the call as a doctor, but uh, I'd like to call the Innocent as the Dr. Innocent Kevanga 
uh, country representative of Ethiopia of the GGGI for your final remarks. Innocent, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Professor Chang. The reason I don't take doctor is because I, I dropped my PhD in Sweden some time back. So I'm Mr. Innocent Kabenga. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank, um, I mean, all those who participated in today. This was a long day, but uh, the exchanges and presentations were very good. I would like to thank the, um, the commission, you know, like everything that we are doing, I think, um, with uh, Hawassa University, of course, with uh, Koeka, Korea University, with yeah. uh, GGGI. We do have the ministry or the commission that is... Um, our link with uh, the government, and this is extremely important. Hawassa University, uh, it has been wonderful, uh, really, for GGGI to link up. Uh, now that um, we are going to start a new project, then we'll be able to collaborate more. Korea University and the Center for Sustainability uh, that um, uh, is represented by Professor uh, uh, Chang. I really, really, really want to thank you, Professor Chang. You are the one who initiated all this. And uh, I'm very happy because the three years program that we have project, if you want, that is, we are concluding today has a lot of fruits. And one of them is the 12 million project that I presented today for um, sustainable landscape restoration in Ethiopia. And this will have more ramification. So I think this project was extremely important. I joined two years ago uh, when I came from uh, uh, Rwanda and uh, I, I arrived in June and end of August, we did the second workshop and I have seen the publications and now we have this project and knowing uh, all of us like this and I'm really happy that we'll continue to collaborate for the next five years through this COICA project. Then I would like to thank Professor uh, oh. Chang for bringing a new uh, element, you know, like the introduction of uh, Kaush University and the pre presentation that was made. This is something extremely important that uh, we don't need to, to stay like in one area where we don't collaborate or think, understand or think about other, what the other people are doing and also linking like the two countries. And I'm sure uh, pro, uh, Professor Motuma from here, he has seen what, how he can link up with uh, this university, which is highly ranked to some uh, universities of science and technology in Ethiopia. So um, just stay well, and it's just bye-bye, uh, but you are still together for the next five years or even more. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Innocent. So uh, uh, I, I don't think uh, I have uh, many things to add uh, based on the, what the, all the colleagues has mentioned. So basically, it has been wonderful. It has been enjoyable time for us to get together. We identified uh, big challenges, also out of it, we found opportunities and we made it as real. And then this will be still a starting point for the bigger opportunities that we can uh, you know, identify in the near future. We have now new partners. Uh, I'm not necessarily talking about the partner organizations here. I, I am talking about everybody in this room. And then without uh, anybody uh, uh, in this room, I don't think we could have done this. So uh, in that sense, I have a uh, you know, privilege uh, to be part of the, this wonderful journey. Uh, this is the uh, end of the present uh, workshop. Once again, final outcome of, our, of this project is to provide the uh, policy recommendations for the government of Ethiopia. That's uh, the project idea that we have been talking a lot this year, uh, today. And also, uh, you know, Sawasa University plan to become a center of excellence. And two final outcomes will be finalized by the end of this year, uh, along with other, you know, activity outcomes that we have built uh, for the last three years. And then, you know, I'm sure that we'll meet again next year to have uh, better topics to discuss about. Maybe with a bigger participation of the coast, right? Uh, you should visit the coast campus. It's wonderful. I've been there several times and then, and then unless you would be there, you wouldn't understand what I'm talking about. So, uh, you know, this will be another chance uh, for us to get together to build a bigger community of uh, this uh, climate and environment in general. 
Having said that, uh, uh, I know that uh, uh, Mr. Tongo Kim is uh, here still. Uh, would you want to say any final words, uh, you know, if we want? Uh, microphone, please. Okay, uh, I'd like to say that with my sincere heart, uh, my great congratulations to all of you, especially to uh, Korea University and also Awasa University, also to GGI uh, and uh, UNDP. So um, even though it, it is very late uh, time in, in Korea, so we uh, finally uh, get to the conclusion. So. I'd like to say my great congratulation, also my great um, um, applause to all of you for your uh, successful um, completion of this three-year uh, project. So uh, this is not the end of our uh, program for the climate change response and the other kinds of environmental uh, projects. So as you, uh, as I mentioned. Um, one of the four major pillars will be a uh, green economy and the climate change uh, response. So we will do our best to promote uh, and expand our uh, current and the future cooperation in that field. So I would like to uh, say that I will very much appreciate if you continue uh, providing your uh, great support to this project. So. Uh, thank you so much for your active participation and thank you for your uh, great uh, and very enthusiastic uh, participation and a good uh, uh, conclusion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, he was the uh, country director of the Koikai in Ethiopia. So I think uh, it's time for us to conclude everything. The, my final, final word is that I should thank the, for the, all the, the staffs that who have been the, actually working really hard to organize this, uh, this workshop. Uh, they spent the numerous times to prepare for this workshop and everything has been almost perfect, I, I think, uh, this, uh, today. So I, I finally would like to thank for my staffs who, who devoted your time and efforts to organize this workshop together. So now this is the end of the workshop. So bye-bye. Uh, and then I look forward to meeting you again in the near future. Bye-bye. David, bye-bye. Um, hello. Thank you, Professor Chong, for concluding the module seven and distinguished participants for giving your concluding remarks. Um, ladies and gentlemen, so we are, we would now like to declare the official closing of today's workshop. And we would like to once again express our thanks to our most distinguished speakers who have spared their precious time to contribute to the workshop. And also we appreciate our trainees passion and patience for on today's workshop. So before we are dismissed, we have a uh, very important notifications. 